we uh, bring the meeting to order, you probably want to uh, cut everyone's mic except for the select board members and Rosemary and yourself, obviously. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've muted everybody. Um, if you want to speak at any time, uh, you want to use the uh, button to raise your hand. Um, it's usually located with the three little dots as one of the more options on the uh, Zoom call. Also, if you are on a telephone, you'll have to dial star six nine in order to unmute or in order to raise your hand. Okay. Is there any changes or additions to the agenda as presented? And I know you got the one on the sheriff's uh, committee appointment for tonight, right? Yes. Uh, as we've discussed in a previous meeting, we were going to uh, do the uh, sheriff's. We had delayed appointing members to the study committee for the law enforcement contract, and um, it didn't make it onto the printed agenda. So. Uh, we'll have to do that tonight. Okay. It has been posted publicly and requested to have submissions. We do have three submissions, but. Okay. Um, uh, the only other thing I wanted to make sure we brought up is the first Monday of September, our work session would be Labor Day. So we need to talk about what we want to do on that one. Has anybody got anything else they want to bring up or add to the agenda or change? No. I, sorry, I just wanted to bring up one um, public comment I got about um, large groups gathering without masks and social distancing. Um, okay, so the whole COVID-19 thing. Yeah, COVID-19 thing, exactly. Okay, anybody got anything else? Okay, well, let's go into it. Is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes? of the past August 3rd meeting. Yes, so moved. Got a motion, do we have a second? Second. Motion and second, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Rosemary, you got the floor. Okay, go ahead, Rosemary. Okay, on the budget status report, they're probably 98% complete. And as of right now, um, it's about 98% spent of budget and 100% of revenue. We're still receiving um, invoices so I need to put, book some more for accounts payable. We got a, a couple today. When you think we would have that reconciled and know what we end the year with? At your regular board meeting in September. Okay. Okay. It sounds like we're to the good a little. Yes, I think we're gonna be very close to what Brian estimated at the year end. And that was in December. Okay, good. And um, the warrants, people, um, are they going to come in and sign those or is you, you going to ask Eric to sign them? What's the board's pleasure? Move to. Uh, and before you make a motion, we also have to approve the tax rate. Would the board think they would like to come in and sign that as well? If you got to come in. Yeah. Either way, but we should probably sign that, eh? I think we should sign that one for yeah. sure. So why don't all board members will come in and sign the warrants? Okay. And the only thing, either thing I had is a tax rate. And does the board want to waive the homestead declaration penalties for this year? Currently it's at around $60, but once people get their tax bills and notice they haven't filed their homestead declaration form, they'll be doing that and there'll be a penalty, a 3% penalty. 
on the education tax. And we can waive it? Yes, you can waive it. What have we done in the past? You've waived it one or two years, but mostly you've um, had the penalty go on the bill. I don't why, know would they, why would uh, they not have filed the Homestead Declaration? What's that got to do with our late bills? It has nothing to do with late bills. Some people, they just, they have taxpayers that are out of state tax uh, preparers, and they don't realize that we have a homestead declaration form that needs to be filled out. Or they filed it late. Are the folks, Rosemary, the folks that filed um, later than normal, the extension that was granted to people, would that? include those folks? No, they should not be getting a penalty because it, okay. it extended to July 15th. Right. Anybody that's filed after July 15th. So this homestead would be for obviously people who this is their primary residence? Yes. Yeah. I don't think this, I don't think in the COVID-19 era that's a question of when they, uh, I think it's a question of the money availability in the community that we ought to be looking at rather than past precedent. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a lot of money, probably five, six hundred dollars at most. What's Boar's pleasure? Mm -hmm. Or if we take no action, it would just be in place. I would move that we waive that penalty. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Why, why did, did you make that motion, Doug, if, you, if I may ask? Because I think it'll probably fall on people who will have uh, difficulty paying it. You know, just people are short of money right now. I mean, I've got no survey on it, but. Uh, I think that uh, it's a reasonable thing to do for in, for people in this time of pandemic. Cardi. Any other discussion? I've got a comment from Chad, if you're ready for it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Beth Foy says that on some tax software, uh, it's a little hard to see and easy to miss. Mm -hmm. Understood. Board prepared to vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, Rosemary. Okay, regarding the tax rate, um, Brian, do you have that so you can share on the screen? I have that ready to go, yep. All right. So you should all see the tax rate now. Yep. yep. Can you make it a little bigger? Yeah. All right. Rosemary, do you want to run through this? Sure. The total municipal grand list was $231,019,300. And the budget that was in the um, town meeting book was 1.859,934.91. And the voters um, increased the town budget by 37,500. And the articles, there was two articles that came to a total of 4,224.48. So that leaves a total need for taxation of 1,901,000. 1059 and 39 cents. And that comes up to a tax rate of 0.8232. And we have a total of for school adjustments in the amount of $9,199.03. And 
and that comes up to a rate of 0 0.004. So that would make a tax rate of 0.8272. That would raise 1.9 million eleven hundred eleven thousand eighty nine dollars and forty four cents. How close is that to our estimate that we had in our town report? That is almost uh, four cents less. Oh, less. Yep. Okay, good. And that's due to the reappraisal. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, and then the uh, the school tax is a given given to us by the tax department from the state. Yep. Yeah. Homestead rate is one point five eight one four and non resident rate stays exactly the same at one point six three two two. Okay. So what's the board's pleasure? Is the board prepared to approve this tax rate as presented? Yes. Yeah, so do we have a second? Second. We have motion and a second. Um, if Donna's on, Brian, would you please make sure that she understands our motion? Uh, okay, let me unmute Donna. All right, Donna, um, you were able to follow that motion and everything? Well, I'm not sure. There was a lot of information presented, and I'm not sure exactly how much of it you want to be in the motion. So maybe you, maybe Rosemary could uh, give me some wording. I think I'll let Rosemary go, sorry. To approve a town tax rate of 0.8272 for the 2021 tax year. Yes. And that okay. was Nat's motion and Kyle's second, I believe. Uh, I believe Doug, Doug seconded that. Or Doug seconded, okay. Correct. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, same for saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. And ask all board members to go in and sign it probably this week, right, Rosemary? That's fine, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll have a due date, tax due date of September 30th. That'll be the first one? Yes. Then what's, that, what's that do to the rest of the uh, cycle? Then we'll, the rest of the cycle will stay the same. Okay. So there'll be a, a second one coming up very no, quickly. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? That's all that I had. Anybody got anything else for Rosemary? Thank you, Rosemary. You're welcome. And was Brian Krause going to be around tonight? Yep. Brian was able to connect. Uh, let's see. Okay, go ahead, Brian. I believe I have sound now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, I am around. Um, I did have a couple things I wanted to talk about. Brian does have my report. One of them... Um, was Overhill. We're going to be ditching and replacing culverts on Overhill and Dukes Road for the next, well, starting next week for two weeks. Um, I just wanted you to be aware of that because we'll shut down traffic most of the days and we'll have it open, you know, non-working hours will be open, but it's easier for us to not do traffic control. and We just shut little segments of the road down as we go. So it's a lot more productive and cheaper. Mm -hmm. And then I did speak with uh, Richard Downer from FEMA on the library door, the waterproof door we had been looking into in the back. Mm -hmm. It was his suggestion that we don't go over four foot tall. He says typically they don't because the buildings aren't designed to handle that kind of load. Um, if we decide to to go with the four feet and not bring an engineer and, and try to get something taller, then we have a couple different options. 
you can do like I had initially kind of thought, just put a piece of plate on with some like hand size wing nuts and just bolt it to the foundation with a, a gasket in there. Or if we want to get a little more elaborate, we can put some angle iron in the door jam, have it on a hinge and have it like locked from the inside. And it's be more, more involved and it has to be done from the inside. So yeah, and it, and it would be, it would be, yeah, it would just be more expensive and harder to implement, implement for one of the town employees because you'd have to access the library in order to make sure it's secured. So your, so recommend it, your recommendation is a four foot high from the engineer? Well, based on what, what the FEMA uh, gentleman told me, yes. Um, we can look into it a little more. Uh, he's sending me, which I have not received yet, he's sending me some more information on designs and whatnot. But he has, his recommendation was to only go four feet high because of the, because of the building and the structural you know, integrity of the wall and, and things like that. Okay. But you're still waiting for more information. Yes, on designs. I, that won't change the, the only thing that would change the four foot high would be if we brought some engineer in and he did what he needs to do and says, yeah, you can go six feet high or eight feet high or however high you want to go. But that would have to be somebody that is an expert in that area. Have you been keeping the library in the loop on this? Uh, I have not. Okay. At, at some point you should be bringing them in, definitely. Yeah, before okay. we do anything, obviously. Yes. Yeah, before we make a final decision, it would be nice. But I wanted to give you a heads up to see which direction you wanted me to continue on this. And board members have thoughts? I'm wondering where four foot gives us in terms of what we might expect for uh, flooding, you know. What? I can't answer that one. Okay. Would any of the, would four foot have protected against any of the recent floods? Yes. I believe so. Uh, four foot would have definitely protected us, although we didn't suffer much damage in November, but it would have helped for that. Uh, for the previous flood, I'm not sure if it would have when we had the ice jam. Um, I think it would have. I think that was closer to two foot, but the only one that I can think of that was the 95 flood definitely would have uh, gone over four feet. Um, let's see, the, I have, I've spoken to Jean somewhat recently, uh, so she, it, she's not, the library is not totally in the dark about this, but this is newer information that we have not yet brought to the library. Okay. Uh, but yeah, they're they're they have not been entirely left out of the conversation. Just th this is newer than what they they have. Okay. Um, besides that, I'm a little worried about when you talk about like the large wing nuts and all that. How quickly and easily that would be able to get installed. Um, at that point, if we're looking at floodgates, I, I like the the floodgates that we that are manufactured that we can slot in, so that it doesn't really take any particular strength or training to install them. In case it somebody from Public Works is not available to install it. Well, that's certainly a good option. Um, what I'm thinking of take five minutes to install. I can't give you a weight exactly because I I had a weight for a four by eight sheet and I don't remember what that was. I have that written down, but I could come up with a weight. It shouldn't weigh that much. It's a piece of aluminum plate. 
um, be four foot high, you know, by four foot wide or close to it. Okay. So it'd take roughly five minutes to install for one of us to install it. I'd have to see what it weighs before I could say somebody else would install it easy. And what's the cost difference between what Brian's story was talking about and what Brian Krause is proposing? I'm not sure what, what Brian's cost is on pre-manufactured. Ours would be roughly $500. It's been long enough that I, I really hesitate to quote a price on that because it's, um, I haven't looked at them recently. It was a heck of a lot more than $500. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, certainly I like to save money and if we can do it uh, for less than a thousand bucks, that would be really fantastic. Um, I'd, I'd definitely like to get the library's input before, um, really making a decision. Well, maybe I could meet with, with Gene uh, down there or somebody down there. We could go over it and then I can report to Brian or maybe Brian could meet with us. So we're all on the same page. That'd be great. Yeah. It might be also worth finding out exactly what those flood manufactured commercial floodgates cost because if the uh, public works department was not available, those floodgates would be consistent with all of the others around the, the town and uh, the fire department's very familiar with them and could easily install them if the public works department wasn't available. If it's not a huge difference in cost, it might be worth it to just stay consistent. Sure. Yeah. I, I think consistency and ease of use is yeah. worth quite a bit. So, Brian Krause, that four foot figure was suggested by the FEMA guy, the FEMA yes. engineer, based on that structure or just based on? Well, he has visited that structure. He had pictures of that structure when I talked to him. Yeah. Um, so I don't, it, it sounded more like it was a general rule. Um, huh. But he has, he has been to that, to that building. So okay. he is familiar with it. And I think, I think he was hesitant as most, you know, engineers would be without doing an, you know, an extensive study to say you can go over four feet. I think it's pretty safe for them to, 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 to say as a general rule, don't go over four feet, you know, and, and you're safe. Okay, any other further comments from the board on that issue? So I'm sure you'll be back to us with more information as you learn more, but thank you for working on this. Hopefully we don't need to do it right off. Hopefully. <laughs> All right, I'll get together with the library, I'll get more information and I'll have that other information shortly, I would imagine. Are we on a timeline to get those done this, this summer or this fall? <laughs> I was if if I was going to build it, yes, it would be built this fall. Cool. All right, thanks. Once we finalize design and, and everybody's on the same page, it wouldn't take that much to do it. I'd really like to know if that uh, person you had up there is is expert enough or was just declining to to opine and go beyond a general rule. Well, Eric, Eric, it's the it's the. Richard Downer is the gentleman that I got the number from. Um, I, that's who I talked to. I got the number from Eric to, to get a hold of this guy. And, and he said that's, that's what he's there for, is to give advice on things like that. I mean, we would have to hire an engineering firm to come in and do that structural uh, study if, if that's what you know, we wanted to do. Looks like that's... <laughs> Not according to our librarian. Can we get Jean's input here? Yeah. Can you turn on her mic? All right, Jean, uh, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, yes, we had an engineering study done. Oh, I would say three or four years ago. Uh, 
And uh, I believe I sent that to you, Brian's story. Um, and they um, studied it for flood proofing and said that we could go higher than four feet. We could go up to the height of the, the door. And I can uh, send that to... Uh, I'm, I, I think I recall that, and I think you have sent that to me. Yeah, uh, and I can send it along to Brian Krause as well, and maybe Brian and I can meet and talk about that once I, you know, once he has a chance to look at it. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> would your aluminum plate idea work with the full length of the door? Beyond four feet? I w uh, initially, that's kind of what I was thinking of doing. Um, I think I'd cut the plate in two because it was heavier than I, I wanted one person to be. You know, two people go hand, don't no problem, but I wanted it to be able to be installed with one person. So I yeah. think I would cut it in two. Um, if I can add to, we do have a uh, contractor, Brian Courier, who um, is an aluminum welder. And he is looking into giving us an estimate for an aluminum door um, that would be on hinges that would be permanently in place. Oh, good. Would, yeah. would that door have a gasket and lo a means of locking to make it waterproof? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, he's coming Perfect. at it and um, he's just been super busy, but uh, I think I should hear from him sometime in the near future. And that was, um, uh, I guess, what he was trying to figure out as to how to put the, the gasket um include the gasket in the door and to do it so we, it would be done correctly well granger sells a wide variety of gaskets and they sell channels that you could put on the back of that aluminum plate to, to accept a, a gasket that they sell uh -huh. it might be a, a road to look at good sounds like we do have some options and maybe we can seal the whole door Okay. Good. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jean. Thanks, Jean. Yeah. All right. Um, and I, I do have one more thing to talk about. Yeah. Um, we are replacing the 4300 next year. And currently, we're building trucks a year ahead of time. That's how backlog they are. Um, so Brian has up on the screen the quote from Clark's for a new truck. Um, if so yeah, so I, I'm kind of looking to get a direction single. on that. Whether you guys want to look at it and then vote, or vote now to go, you know, go ahead. However, you guys want to do it. What what you're saying is the backlog is so great that we should be looking at ordering something now for next year. Yeah, we have two trucks scheduled to be replaced in 21-22. Okay. So both those trucks are going to go through another winter, but by the following winter, they're scheduled to be replaced. So we need to, we're going to, I want to order, I'm just focusing on one right now, and I'm going to bring another one up next month. But for us to have them for next winter, not this winter, but the following year, we need to order them, you know, we need to order them soon. And they're, um, uh, I'm sure they're familiar that we wouldn't be able to put any money down until voters approve town budget. Yes. Okay. Yeah, he's he's aware of that. Okay. Typically, we don't we don't get any money until we take delivery. We don't give them any money. Right. Well, Brian, uh, go ahead, you, Carl. Sorry, would we be trading something in? or yeah okay yes trading something in the cost after trade-in would be a hundred and seven thousand dollars was close to a hundred and eight thousand a hundred and seven some i see yeah 
Oh, there it is, 107.8. And this is all consistent with our capital equipment fund and replacement schedule. So it would be in putting that order out now instead of in the typical February timeframe that we do it. Yes. yes. Is the board comfortable doing that? Um, a couple of things. Um, well, I think not to be too pedantic, but um, before committing to a $108,000 uh, purchase, even though it is in our, um, our plan, um, we should probably at a minimum like warn it in the in the meet in the uh, agenda before we vote on it so i wouldn't think we i wouldn't really think it's proper to vote on something that large without warning at first um it seems like a very smart thing to do i'd also like to, to see the quote and have some time to look at it ahead of the meeting but i i, I appreciate it i um i just don't know that much brian you were going to bring back for next month the next the other the second truck correct that is correct. I do not have that quote with me. They are changing lines. So I can't get a quote till it's closer to the September meeting. Mm -hmm. Be because they're ending, they're ending certain features and lot and items on this truck. So we're kind of in the middle of middle between their factory switchover, however you want to phrase that. What I was suggesting maybe to, uh, with Nat's point, having it as a warned article item in our agenda, if you came back to us next month with both proposals, if the board is in agreement. Just in a couple of weeks. How long will they hold this price or how long do we have to accept it? I don't know what it says on there, but I'm sure a month isn't going to matter. I'm sure he would hold it for a month if he's been consistent with all his other quotes. I don't see anything on here about an expiration. Um, why don't we get in touch with them and let them know that we've got to go for another meeting. They'll probably extend it for us if we ask them to. Well, it's yeah. already two months since his signature. So I'm guessing yeah, one more month. This in June. We did not get this in June. So no, this is the first time I'm presenting it to you. Yeah. But he signed it back in June, mid-June, and we're two months from there now. I'm guessing 30 more days is not going to be a big deal. No, no, and he was fine. He knows I was bringing it to the board tonight and he's fine with the price. I'm sure another month won't matter, but I will double check. Okay. I think besides that point about warning this is that uh, uh, we may not know much more, but the legislature is about to return and I don't think there's uh, any sign that the following tax year and our budgets will be uh, what we're used to. That's true. Yep. That's a good point, Doug. So, so I, I'm in favor of a month or, or a little delay to think about this. I think it's a wonderful thing to uh, consider in normal circumstances. I'd say absolutely jump on it, yes, right now. But I think we should wait. And if you can get this out to us, you know, a little bit prior to the meeting so we can... Uh, have an opportunity to review it to individually okay and i'll get the other one out as soon as i get the other one which is going to be a, probably a week before the meeting next month okay. i'll get that to brian and he can disperse it amongst everybody perfect thank you anything else mm, nope that should do it for me Anybody got anything for Brian? Go ahead, Matt. Couple issues. Um, one is just an inquiry on paving. We uh, got a couple bids, and we were going to wait for a, to see if we got a grant before we answered the bids. And I'm wondering, have we addressed that yet? No, we have not. 
what's uh, are we still waiting to hear from the state? We haven't received a determination on that grant award. Wow. Okay. All right. Great. Answers my question. Do we have um, any timeline for that? No. Okay. Um, the other is just about, I don't know if this is Brian Krause specific, but it's highway related, um, is on uh, gravel and the new gravel pit. Um, and I've just been, I've been thinking about it. Um, we had some bore samples done and, and um, you know, we haven't had time to review them yet, but I'm just thinking, you know, if we were to start reviewing that bore sample data now, it's possible that we could negotiate maybe I, you know, under the best circumstances it's possible that we could negotiate a deal with the owner, um, before in advance of town meeting to put it before the voters. If we did that between closing, going through act 250, MSHA building the road and doing the site work, I think that we wouldn't even be into that pit until it just, Think, think it through until at least uh, um, summer of 2022. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking that I'd, I'm hoping maybe we can clear some time away out of Brian and Brian's schedule to really dig in pretty aggressively on that so that we can uh, sort of resolve that issue. Wondering I would what, be all for that. But what do we got for life left in our gravel pit? A couple of years. <laughs> You've been saying that for a couple of years. <laughs> well, we we were they, we had moved some material that that some of us I was told there wasn't material under there that was worth anything, and we had to get it out of the way, and we we found some extra material in there, so it's working out good for us. Yeah, well, it could but easily. It's, it's not going to last forever. It could easily take a, it that long before we are even able to get in there. Yes, it, I think I think you're correct. It will take that long. And I see you're doing some remediation. You've done a lot of great work, from what I, I haven't been down there, but on remediating the the old pit, the current pit. Um, I don't know. If yes, and and put into... in a couple of weeks, um, probably the middle of September, um, we should see that that high wall finished off and seeded and get some grass on there before it gets too cold. I don't know if, if I'm just, I don't know where we can get the time from, but if there are projects that we have to put off in order to focus more on gravel, um, I, I think we, I think we should do it. I think we can make the time for it. We've got to get back with uh, uh, Jacques was the, consultant uh, in Waterbury uh, that we'd selected for analyzing the core samples. And uh, I want his, a little bit more advice from him on, uh, on analysis that what I've written in my estimates, um, yeah, I'm not a professional on this. He gave us some analysis. I tried to write a narrative to help it out and I want to run it by him before we make any real presentation. Awesome. And this was the area that's, uh, well, next to where the current gravel pit is? Yes. Okay, on the other side of that little stream? I believe so, yes. Yes. Okay. It'd be interesting, I mean, before we put a lot of effort into that particular site, to, and maybe he can give us that provide that information on what what amount of gravel there is there and you know is it worth our time investment and all that but I think Nat's got a good point we got to get moving on it because it will take a lot of time to negotiate an agreement with the owner and if it pans out to where you know it's worth going after yep. Thank you, Nat. Is there anything else? Anybody have anything else for Brian? No, I just, I just wanted to 
say, um, speaking of time, that I, I just wanted to thank Brian and crew for um, installing the flower boxes on the Railroad Street Bridge, um, which was a Johnson Beautification Committee um, thing. And um, yeah, they look great. A couple just need to be shored up a little bit better, but um, they did a great job. So thank you for that time. Welcome. Nobody's tried to kick them off or anything like that. Just the wind, as far as I can tell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah. No. Uh, maybe some potential little tampering, but nothing. Nothing to report, really. So. Good. Good. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Brian's story. I guess we. Can, is there anything that you have that Brian Krause would want to stick around for? Maybe towards the end of the meeting, but uh, we talked about it and it'll depend on kind of how late we go. Okay. Well, then why don't we get into your agenda or your report? All right. So uh, first up, uh, the adoption of municipal policies, policies and codes as required for the receipt of the uh, Vermont Community Development Program Grant. So this is the community development block grant that we applied for with Jenna's Promise uh, to, um, to redevelop the uh, house on Main Street. Barrow's house. Bar Barrow's house, thank you. Um, that redevelopment money requires us to adopt uh, this form MP1, which I'll put up so everybody can read it. Uh, well, we won't really read the cover to cover. It was in the select board packet, uh, and it is a little long for cover to cover reading. But this is uh, very similar. It's just been updated. You can see right here at the top, it's been updated for 20 uh, in 2017. So the last time we accepted money from this organization, we had to adopt a very similar set of codes and standards about uh, equal access and equal opportunity. And we just need to update our, 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 our commitment to it. Um, running through this quickly, uh, it says that we are an EEO, uh, that, that we adopt an EEO policy so that we you know, do not discriminate against, uh, discriminate against denied benefit of any activity uh, to any uh, protected class. We have a couple conditions uh, that get a little bit more specific and a description of what that policy entails. Similarly, we've got a fair housing policy uh, which says that we uh, apply equal opportunity to all, all housing programs uh, that we use related funds for. So we will not discriminate when we're awarding contracts as it relates to housing development. And so Brian, yeah. um, sorry to interrupt here, but so, Just to be clear, so we're updating this to be able to uh, provide um, our support in this grant process. And will Jenna's promise then be beholden to this, these set of guidelines when they're determining who's going to be living at the you know the housing units and getting jobs at the coffee shop and all that i would yes basically that they, they will have to adopt non-discriminatory practices also okay okay that's what and i did that that was the nice. use of federal federal funds requires participants to uh I guess these are state funds, but the, the, the use of public money requires folks to adopt policies similar to this. Okay, that was my question, thank you. Yep. 
I saw Greg on earlier. I don't know if you want to weigh in on that, Greg, or if you're all set. Looks like you're all set. Okay, so I'm gonna keep rolling with, with this. I, I, I don't mean to do it a disservice by running through it quickly. It's just, it's too long to read in full and it is in the packet if anybody's interested in, in more detail. Um, so in addition to awarding contracts, the next part uh, that we will not cite facilities, housing or accommodations uh, in ways that exclude uh, protected classes. Um, you know, we will comply by that. Uh, we will not discriminate based on uh, handicap status. Uh, the municipality will not directly or through contracting uh, use age. Uh, we won't discriminate based on age either. Uh, this one doesn't exactly apply to us, but we would not uh, condone the use of excessive force. Uh, we will not use the funds for federal lobbying. And that we will adopt a code of ethics in relation to the use of these funds. Uh, that we have a drug-free workplace. And we've got a little bit on our uh, monitoring policy of subrecipients, and th this would be Jenna's promise. You know, and that this is basically, it's ultimately our responsibility that uh, they are also following non-discriminatory practices. Uh, that we will protect whistleblowers. And that, yeah, that, that wraps it up. Uh, so this is something that's required for us to undertake if we want to receive the money from the community development program. Um, we have the very similar uh, Similar policy already adopted for when we accepted money for Sterling Market. Um, there's just a couple, there's a little bit of language that's been updated since then. Good, thank you, Brian. If the board so approves this, adopts it, um, I'm gonna suggest that we all go in and sign because we're all gonna have to go in and sign the other two items anyhow. But what's the board's pleasure? Yeah, I, sorry, I, I have a few more questions on this. Sure. Um, um, I actually see that it that it came up in the chat also. But um, so, Brian, do we have as a board, since we're we're tasked as being sort of the overseers to make sure that discriminatory practices are or are not happening? What do we have? What what's our? How do we do that? Do we have a Largely, you would uh, kind of our practice for that is uh, our bidding process that we undertake currently. Um, and the second one, second part for that would be your, for the most part, you would designate those responsibilities that you have been designating those responsibilities to me to oversee our, our contracts and when we bring in contractors to oversee their practices. Okay. It, okay. And so how are you doing that? Like what's uh, our, Usually our with con contact with the contractors of, I try and, you know, be aware of, um, aware of their working conditions, how they're supporting their employees. Um, a certain amount of it is that, uh, trying to think uh, a certain amount of it is 
uh, kind of to rely on the whistleblower protections that we will protect people who do come forward. Um, that we don't have uh, we don't have active participation in every contractor that we have, but uh, they are part of a network and part of a uh, scheme. We're not working with anybody who is unknown to us. Uh, so we've been fortunate that, um, yeah, that, that we haven't had any particularly hard questions about this. Okay, so we more wait for the complaints to come in, in, rather than being well, more proactive. I mean, on their protections for their employees and their work habits, we're mostly overseeing them for visible actions. You know, we're asking them to certify that they, uh, they, they follow the, the general guidelines, but we don't do an audit of their employment records or, you know, their hiring practices or uh, anything to, to that level. Mm -hmm. But we, again, being a small town, we don't have that many different people bidding on projects. Um, we work with people that we, uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to generally work with people that we know. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering now that we're starting to do this a little bit more, like it was just Sterling Market now, more with Jenna's promise, if we shouldn't um, get more, ro you know, a little bit more uh, robust sort of uh, procedures in, in place, just in terms of the oversight. Um, I don't know what you think, but that's sort of my gut feeling. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's something that I would, I, I think that you're right that as we're doing more of this um, and we're a little bit more active with it, you know, maybe we should have a greater oversight role. Uh, it's something I would want to uh, probably get a little bit of training and some support on uh, that I don't have a particular specialty in HR and uh, going through another company's records to examine these things uh, would be mm -hmm. a little challenging. I'd want to make sure, again, any records that are given to me become public records unless they're protected. So there might be things that they wouldn't want to share with me that's not necessarily problematic that they don't want to share it just that again they don't want it to be a, become a public record mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. i'd want to have a better understanding of how to avoid how to spot when that's a problem versus just somebody protecting you know their, their confidentiality and their privacy mm -hmm. yeah I, I guess i'm just yeah I'm just thinking like, you know, um, statistically, uh, you know, women and minorities often don't feel comfortable coming forward when there's a problem. And so rather than kind of relying on that as our barometer to make sure that we are, I mean, if we're, if we are the responsible party, then, you know, that we are, um, we're really, uh, you know, um, doing doing our due diligence and um, protecting the most, you know, vulnerable populations for sure. So, I know, I mean, not saying that this should turn into a, a full-time job for you, but I'm just saying that, you know, we, we need to also make sure that we're, we're upholding our end of the bargain. Yeah. Um you know, I had, again, mostly we, we ask people to self-certify that they are complying. Uh, and in the absence of uh, a complaint, we 
believe them when they, they self-certify that they are compliant. Uh, it's very much the level of oversight they have on us is that until we have a complaint, we're taken at our word that we don't, when we say we don't uh, discriminate and that we believe in these practices, uh, they, our oversight, the, the uh, State Department of Labor trust us on that. So is there a great deviation between the previous one and this one? There isn't. Uh, I didn't have a, as much time to compare the two as I wanted. Uh, I don't believe the use of force was in there before. Uh, and uh, a little bit of wording in the first grouping uh, about employment access was changed. So I'm assuming that the current policy would be uh, would have teeth and, and we could be responsible for it if we had a grant that was applicable to, uh, but we can't get a grant that's applicable to it, applicable in this area unless we accept this policy. Yes. All right. Uh, Greg has his hand up if we're ready for some questions from the audience. Yeah, why don't you let Greg go ahead. All right, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, good evening. Uh, we, uh, th this home is for uh, treatment of folks that are suffering from substance use disorder. And uh, in the last year, we financially assisted 50 people into sober homes throughout the state of Vermont. And um, be, to be honest, we, we don't know what race these folks are or what their sexual origin is or or anything and we just keep helping these people and nor nor do we care if they're white black or hispanic or whatever they you know whatever wherever they come from so um, that won't be an issue here at all we're we're just here to help people through this uh substance use disorder and uh, like i said we don't we, we, we've helped over 50 people and, you know, I, I honestly don't know uh, where they, whether they're Vermonters, but I don't know what, what their origin is. So, and, and we don't really care. We just want to help people. That's, that's all. But I understand Kyle wants to make sure that the town is uh, not liable for some foolish thing. So, uh, but uh, I don't see that happening here. Uh, but you got to do what you got to do. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Um, oh, no problem. Thank you. But, but will your organ does your organization have policies around this already or plan to make policies around this? Yes, uh, I mean, we I, are. We're I, I, I do trust you, but I know there, that your organization is bigger than just you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's not much, it's not much bigger than Tony and I, but yes, we're uh, yeah. probably going to be growing. Absolutely. Yeah, we will have house rules. Um, and the state government is working on a sober living program. And there's also, a, uh, I can't think of the acronym right now, but uh, there's a, a organization that you, you get approved to be a certified um, sober living and, and we will be doing that. And that ha comes with house rules and probably a lot of the same things that are in this uh, uh, piece of uh, paper here. So um, yeah, it'll, it'll, we'll have good house rules. We're working on it. Uh, and uh, you know, people are gonna work downstairs. Uh, really the only, reason that you would uh, uh, ask someone to leave is because um, if they're bringing uh, going back to using drugs again and, and uh, the reason you do that is because you don't want the whole house to be uh, 
vulnerable to uh, usage. But the state is coming up with a program that says if somebody is using in a sober living house, you have to have a plan on where these folks are going to go because they don't want them just turned out in the streets. So there's there's quite a lot of activity going on uh, in the sober living space here in Vermont uh, at this point. Brian, for us to accept this money, we have to sign a policy that, that they've you just went over here, and it's not a lot different from any we've done in the past, but I had always assumed that the recipient would also have something similar provided to them, but maybe tailored a little different for a business or whatever. But am I incorrect in, in recalling that Sterling Market had to sign something like this? I'm not sure what it looks like for what they have to sign, but they do have to, um, again, because we will be committing to, we won't award money to uh, individuals and organizations that uh, are not also equal opportunity. They will have to have something to self-certify that they are an equal opportunity right. organization. So the state or the feds will be following up with Jenna's promise before they can receive the money, they would have to sign something similar. As Some I lines. understand it, I believe that they would uh, file with both the, uh, the feds and with us. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it mostly relies on uh, self-reporting and uh, and whistleblower actions. This is a, a very, very broad kind of a scattershot thing. It covers uh, employment, uh, it, it covers uh, all sorts of different discriminations, fair housing. It, it you know, it, it may not be applicable in many of the areas. It, uh, they do a lot of different grants. I, I think that we ought to, uh, I'd move that we uh, adopt this uh, policy as set out, and and then and then I would I would have a suggestion later. I just think that uh, to get this money, we need to do we need to uh, adopt this policy, and uh, then we should evaluate the policy at some point and see what we need to do or where we might be short. But my motion would be to uh, adopt this policy. In this form. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and second. Any more discussion? Um, Brian, I'm wondering if you could just um, read some of the comments in the in the chat that I think are pertinent. Yes. Thanks. I'm happy to. Uh, let's see. Uh, Rick Opperly points out it does say that attempts will be made to contact known sources of minority and women potential applicants to maximize participation of such applicants. Um, I'd say to a limited extent, uh, we already do that. Uh, that's largely hampered by, I'm not aware of very many, uh, when we're awarding contracts, I'm not aware of very many uh, women or minority owned uh, businesses that for a lot of the contract services that we have. You now I'm in touch with uh, Du Bois and King right now about um, the engineering study for the um, Scribner Bridge, uh, trying to get a, a quote on, on that study. And just as one example, I'm not aware of any women or minority owned businesses that would have the same expertise to do a, a job like that. Uh, that's similar for our paving for, uh, you know, a few other areas. So we make an effort, but that's mostly, um, it's easiest to do when we're hiring for jobs, when we're awarding contracts. Um, there's not that many local businesses that can execute a lot of the contracts that we need. So we don't go, 
we don't make a an extra effort to uh, contact minority or, or women-owned businesses. Uh, Jackie asked who is responsible for oversight of these stipulations. I think we, we answered that, that the town is responsible uh, for the town uh, and Jenna's promise is it responsible for Jenna's promise, but the town has a little, has an interaction with Jenna's promise in that the town being responsible for its own actions and it's awarding this money to Jenna's promise. We have to, you know, get Jenna's promise certification that they are abiding by it as well. Uh, but we don't. As well as we're usually audited by the agency that's given us the money. Yes. Uh, Scott, uh, whistleblower rules are federal via the Department of Labor and Vermont also has whistleblower rules that are done uh, by the State Department of Labor. Um, yes, uh, some of these things like the, the whistleblower, um, it would be against the law for us to interfere with a whistleblower coming forward with a real complaint, uh, with a complaint anyway. So this is just certifying that we we will not, but yeah, it would be against the law for us to interfere anyway. Uh, and then Cal asks if there's a comprehensive plan available for Jenna's Promise, uh, what services will be offered, treatment, Milu, and et cetera. Um, we're doing okay on time tonight, but I am a little bit concerned. I'm gonna, uh, Cal and Greg, with your permission, I'd like you guys to connect offline rather right now in the meeting if you're both okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any more discussion? Um, Go ahead, Kyle. Well, I think we're having a connection problem with you. The, um, Carl, can you repeat what you said? Did we lose her? I'm not seeing her move anymore. You back? Uh, I heard you just then. You did. Okay. I, all right. I just shut my video off, hoping that that will help with the connection. Sorry. I think it's helping a little bit, but it's still a little hard to understand you. I, okay. Okay. I'm not hearing anything. Are you, Brian? Uh, no, I'm not. Carl, if you can hear us, we're not hearing anything from you. That's a good idea. Kyle, can you use the chat function to ask your question? I think she disconnected and hopefully she'll be able to reconnect. Okay. Oh, we'd had such a good run of a uh, few technical problems. <laughs> when you get hit with them. Yeah. Um, would we like to table this for a few minutes to give Kyle a chance to ask her a question and, and move on to the next area? Yeah, why don't you move on to the, the letter? Uh, so Jenna's Promise has requested a letter of support for uh, a different grant that they have applied for and received uh, for work on Jenna's house, the, the church on St. John Street, the old church on St. John Street. Uh, the, le the grant that they're working on is going to be uh, in relation to 
uh, finishing upgrades and other uh, other redevelopment of, of that property. Um, Greg, you want to speak a little bit to that letter of support, what you're looking for from the town? Yes, uh, we did receive a USDA grant for 250000 and uh, our match up there is 114000 So um, the folks from the USDA said, well, we don't really care where the match comes from. It could come from anywhere. And so we reached out to the BGS, and uh, that's Building Communities Grant Project. And uh, we're doing a lot of handicap uh, accessibility work and uh, we're going to have a lift so that folks can get from the main floor to the basement so uh, anybody can come to anything there shouldn't be any uh, reason they shouldn't couldn't um, so we're looking probably about a twenty thousand dollar grant from bgs to help us knock that 114 down uh, some Perfect. And this isn't a town for any funds. We're not uh, an active participant in this grant. Uh, it just, we, uh, I'd like to write a letter on the board's behalf that the town supports uh, efforts to redevelop and improve that space. Okay, has Carl made it back? She is not. I got a text from her that she's having uh, some. Okay. Well, is the board prepared to vote on the, the motion that's still on the floor? Basically adopting the uh, municipal policies as provided by the grant provider? Yeah. Okay, hey, uh, let's see, we do have a quorum still. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And the chair votes in favor, of those against, nay. Motion passes. Now look for a letter of support for Jenna's promise. What's the board's pleasure there? I move that we... Uh, uh, have Brian write a letter of support for Jenna's promise, seeking grant funding that they're pursuing. I'll second. Got a, motion, got a motion, a second. Any more discussion? Carl, if you can hear us. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you now. I don't know what uh, this is. Okay. So we uh, we took we voted already on the adoption of the municipal policies. That motion passed. We're now on a motion to for a letter of support for Jenna's promise. They've gone for another grant to help them in the uh, uh, work at the old church place. Basically, they're just looking for a letter of support. Okay. Uh, if you got any questions, Greg is still there. If you want to ask. Um, I did have some questions. Um, okay, so this is for Jenna's house. On, okay. Um, yeah, I guess just the question to go back to um, also just being very interested in seeing the, the comprehensive plan. I, I feel like I know the plan in theory, which sounds great, um, but would love to start seeing some of the more nuanced nuts and bolts of how it's all um, coming together because this is this is a huge thing for our town and a, a potentially really amazing thing for our town. But I just think uh, it's really important that we we we're really clear on exactly how how it's all going to work. So I'd be very interested in that plan as well, if possible. And I would make a request to Greg. You you were very good at inviting us to different things as you were rolling it out when you had you know congressional a guest there and seeing your plan if you're doing anything virtually if you could invite the board so that we can you know keep up with what your your big plan is 
Yeah, I'm more than happy. Uh, you guys have been very supportive, and uh, we're trying to do the trying to do the right thing. We we definitely believe in our community in uh, Johnson, and uh, we'd like participation. and And you know, we're going to need some help making some decisions and talking about things. And, um, we definitely, uh, Kyle, I will get you uh, our plan. We're still working on it. We have a a lady, Erin Stewart, she's the head of psychiatry for the UVM uh, Health Center out of Plattsburgh, and she's put together a plan. Um, almost done. I saw a draft of it this weekend. So, I mean, it's going to be uh, this this woman is incredible, and she goes all over the country. So, uh, very lucky to have her on board, and uh, it should be should be one of the best ones in the state, if not the best. What's your name again, Greg? Sorry, I missed it. Dr. Aaron Stewart. Aaron Stewart. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You can look her up. She's got yeah. quite a resume. Okay. Yeah. Anything that you have in writing, I'd love to see, Greg. That would be awesome. Yeah. We'll get you, get it to, uh, we'll, I can send it to Brian once things get finalized and uh, Brian can distribute, however, or if you want to meet down there and talk about it, go over it. We're, more than happy to do that at any time. Yeah. Okay, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, Brian, the ATV speed limit request. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and mute you again, Greg. You're welcome to speak up uh, about the ATVs if you want, but uh, yeah. all right. Uh, so we've received a couple complaints about ATVs on Hoag Road, uh, and a resident there uh, would like us to consider uh, reducing the speed limit along the whole length of Hoag Road from Clay Hill uh, to Route 100 C. What's uh, the speed limit currently? It's 25 for most of it, especially the section uh, past the last residence. Uh, that around where the last residence is, we worked with the uh, Green Mountain ATV to lower the speed limit to 15. Um, uh, as of our meeting last month, um, but the the space in between the last residence and Clay Hill is, uh, you know, it, it's a pretty difficult to pass uh, uh, class four road right now. So it's not really open to cars. So it's mostly been used by uh, local residents and others for, for hiking. Uh, the, the resident in that area has complained and feels that uh, there's a lot of littering waste and abuse by ATVs in the area and that it is a challenge for her uh, at her home and with her uh, rental business. And I believe that she is online and would like to speak if we're ready to hear from her. Yeah, let's, uh, do the board members have anything they'd like to ask Brian before we let the uh, whoever's from Hoag Road complaint? If not, I guess open it up, Brian. Okay, uh, go ahead, Kirsten. Okay, hi. Um, so yeah, I I have been living at this property for 20 years, and um, I recently bought the property across the road from my home, and I I have been renting it out to people, and they come there as because it's a very incredibly be beautiful, peaceful place to retreat to um to visit and basically now they're they're saying they don't feel comfortable walking on the road because of the atv traffic and um so i think that it's just not working this is i'm noticing a lot of um speeding going much later than the designated hours and um, so I believe that it would be really great to 
try to not have this running through the natural environment because it is also impacting the wildlife and the it's you know you can't the um basically the the puddles are now filled with oil slicks there's a lot of that around and it's just not great for the wildlife it's it's really disruptive in many ways and um, very difficult to live live with so I can't enjoy I it's very difficult for other people to enjoy it as well so um, I would like to know how we can change this and um, what are the possibilities of of having having people be able to enjoy their their environment if they you know in this area what can we do board members have a question um i can try and address the question can you hear me yep go ahead now so Kristen, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for listening. So the, the ATVs are, are permitted on class three and class four roads in Johnson by means of an ordinance that was passed about 16 years ago. Um, it wasn't passed by this board. It was passed by, or any select board, it was passed by the town as a whole by by a town meeting vote. Um, so, so that's why um, ATVs are, are permitted on Hoag Road. Um, the, this particular year, I think with COVID, what we've seen is, what we've seen statewide is a real explosion of ATV use. Can I interrupt? Um, um, is that okay? I'm sorry, but last year is when it began because um, the ATV, V Club came in and transformed the class four road into a road that suits them better for driving on it. So what happened was um, it got really bad for ATVs way before COVID for me up there on Hoag Road. So I don't know if it's the same with other communities in the area, but I don't think it's just since COVID. Understood. Thank you. It sounds like they've made they've made improvements to that road and they're using it more. And, they also have that connector across Route 100C now, so I can see why how it would be more popular. Um, and I think that was started last year. Um, so anyway, that that ordinance has has been in place for a long time. I think you know it would it would take a town meeting vote, in in my opinion, to um, to change that, to override that. Um, in terms of designated uh, litter, noise, oil slicks, Brian. That those are really concerning issues. Um, I know. What are, yeah. What is the enforcement? How is that being enforced with the the noise and the litter and the after hours? Yeah. Um, so um, our strategy recently has been to work with the at the local ATV club um, since um, since that's what the, the town ordinance is to work with the eight local ATV club to things clean to keep things enforced to keep things to reduce the speed limit i think the atv club was the first to come to us asking to lower the speed limit because he was trying to lower the speed limit but he couldn't because the ordinance didn't allow him to or i don't know but um ken t i don't know ken's last name but he's been to a couple of our meetings and has um, really expressed a lot of interest in um in getting his riders to obey those laws. And if they can't, then we're gonna to have to restrict the freedoms of the ATV riders. But for now, I think we, we need to be working with Ken and his group, um, the, the good ATV riders to um, enforce and um, reduce the behavior of these, these bad apples that are um, creating so much um, trouble for you. Thank you. Nat, I think his last name is Tarancho. Thank you. Yes. Um, right, he's not on the call, is he? No, he's not. Okay. I, there are neighbors in my neighborhood who are, I guess that goes without saying, um, 
is redundant, but who are comp have similar complaints that uh, houses right next to the road uh, can't sleep on a Sunday. Lots of, lot, uh, I would point out that the uh, the roads are being enjoyed by the ATV riders, and that is there's a, another set of people who are not enjoying it. Um, the I think that the the Hoag Road uh, section ought to be looked at together with the whole layout of, of these uh, roads and the usage and it certainly ought to involve discussions with the with the local and maybe the state ATV uh, organizations. Um, it was that I thought that that was a select board adopted ordinance and that there was a public meeting on that. I, I, which I didn't attend that meeting. Do you know, Brian, which it is? I thought it's a town ordinance. It um, is a town ordinance. We, as I recall it, and I wasn't here at the time, but as I recall the process, uh, there was enough signatures raised uh, yes. to contest it so that it went to a town meeting for a vote to uphold the ordinance or rescind it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Lois, Lois Fry could probably address this, but because uh, I think she was on the committee, but there was a committee that uh, wrote up, was charged with uh, working on that ordinance and uh, the it was rewritten and taken out of their hands and the committee resigned afterwards. The uh, ordinance was adopted by the select board and then then I think probably the ordinance was uh, supported at the uh, town meeting. Yes, that, that's basically what happened. Okay. There was a petition raised, uh, which like any ordinance that we write, uh, a petition can be raised to uh, bring it to a full town-wide vote. And that's what happened. It's a very difficult area. Uh, I think that the ATV riders are enjoying our back roads. I think that uh, they, by their very existence there, are interfering with uh, the pleasure of other people. So, and I think it's a town-wide issue. Uh, some places of more uh, strength of, of reaction than others. So uh, I, I would propose that we don't limit an examination of this to Hoag Road, that it be, we consider the entirety of it and we bring in, bring in the players. Yeah. We're, we're experiencing something that was very similar when the snowmobiles first, you know, came around about 60 years ago or 70 years ago. Um, you know, you, you had uh, uh, very hellions out there at first. It was very disorganized. Uh, then VASP got organized around 1970, took over, uh, really started policing their own group. And that's sort of where VASA now is, is in that infancy stage of policing their own uh, membership. And it'll take a while, but uh, you know, I think we're already starting to see some of the economic impact contributions from this yeah, group. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I just yeah. wanted to turn in when I can, sorry. Yeah, I'm just you know, a little, laying out a little bit of history that's happened. Uh, um, and as far as the half of Hoag Road, about half of it is a class four highway. And the class four highways are open to ATVs by state statute. That's beyond our control. But we did open up all of our class three dirt roads and a few paved roads to make connections, uh, you know, years ago. Um, regarding years ago, I believe like right now ATVs in this time are so different from what they were years ago and there's so many more of them and they seem much louder as well and I'm also wondering about what how it devalues our property up here to have ATVs roaring by at such a level of noise that is um, just very disturbing for many people so I, I'm quite curious about the devalue of property what, what do you think of that 
Well, we just had a townwide reappraisal completed and I was not aware of any values that were devalued because of ATVs or any other road use. Did the appraisers ask about that? The appraisers look at all, all factors when they are grading a piece of property. Not if they're not aware of it. Not if they're not aware of it. Yeah. Brian, has, has Ken been made aware of the, the concerns around litter um, and uh, riders going past uh, the curfew hours? Uh, I've spoken with him about it before. I've got to reach out and get with him about this, that, that this is uh, you know, an ongoing and additional problem. That I, I've spoken to him about this in the past, but uh, yeah, uh, I need to reconnect uh, with him about it. Yeah, Kirsten, thank you, thank you so much for speaking your truth. It sounds really awful. <laughs> thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Yeah, I I just want to say that um, that it's real. I think it's very important that we listen to our residents about their experience and their loss of quality of life, because even if that's not a tangible thing that we can put a dollar value on, I think it's really, really important that we don't kind of sweep it to the side as not important. So I just want to say that I think it's very important. Um, and I also want to say that when Ken was here last speaking to us about coming, ATVs coming into the village, um, my recollection is he said that there, they, there hasn't been any complaints, that he doesn't hear complaints, that, I mean, he put on a very good um, show of that, you know, that, that ATVs are quiet or a low hum. That's what he said to me when I asked that question about noise, that, um, that they're good stewards to the land. Um, and I'm sure there are many that are, but, um, but it sounds from what I'm hearing also from folks that live on Gould Hill, Clay Hill, it's, it's really impacting um, their quality of life. And I think that he needs to, to hear that. I think we need to really start um, demanding better um, and, and potentially, yeah, relook at things because it's true. ATV is like anything, like cars, like trucks, like anything. They change and evolve, and it sounds like they have become more uh, sporty and more, um, yeah, just much more robust. And you know, these are off-road vehicles for a reason. They're not. They were never designed to be on on roads. So that that's. Um, I think it's yeah. I think it's creating problems, and we really need to we really need to uh, be again proactive about addressing them. So, again, Kirsten, thank you for coming and speaking to us. It's it's not easy. Thank you so much, Kyle. And well, it's the board's pleasure on the request. Do we want to run it through, Ken? Well, what do we have to do? The request is to lower the speed limit, right? Yeah, uh, that <laughs> was kind of where conversation with uh, Kirsten had started a while ago uh, about more the area around her house and that, that, that she used personally. Uh, and it's evolved a little bit since this was written. Uh, that it, it sounds like a larger issue and it sounds like uh, I think what's been shared is, is that uh, you know that we probably want to have Ken and other representatives from VASA in to have a uh, a, li a more lengthy discussion with them. Um, we can also talk about this as a specific action but that's kind of why our conversation went afield from just that section of HOAG. Mm -hmm. Right. It seems like a month ago we were talking about this was a splinter conversation where we were talking about something else and then it went on to Ken wanting to trying to lower the speed limit. 
but our signs were up that said 25 miles an hour. He didn't want to take our signs down, but he wanted to lower the speed limit. So I'm, I would move that we lower the speed limit on Hawaii Road to 15 miles an hour. So this is different than what we talked about with Ken last month. Ken and I did work and were able to lower the speed limit for the occupied length of Hoag Road. Uh, this would lower the rest of it where there aren't any homes. Uh, the class four section that's very difficult to pass uh, towards Clay Hill. I don't know, I haven't walked up there since they did the work that Christian was talking about, but um, it'd be pretty tough to go much more than 15 miles an hour up there. Um, so I don't, I can't imagine this is going <laughs> to. Yeah. And I don't want to, I'm not discouraging your decision. I just want to be clear about what we're talking about, that this is different than something you agreed to last month. Yes. Yes. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. So were you making a motion now? I did. Yeah. Were you, okay. What was your motion? The lower the whole. Yeah. Lower the whole Hawaii road to 15. Correct. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I will second that. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? I think that this shouldn't be done piecemeal. This is a this is a town wide problem, and I don't think you should do equivalent of uh, you know spot speed limits. I think that we need to address this uh, for. We need to look at the routes these ATVs are traveling, where the hills are, where they where you get get the noise, you know, where they throttle up, where they throttle down. You you know, this this is uh, just a squeaky wheel getting the grease. And I, I think it's too piecemeal. Yeah. I don't disagree that it maybe shouldn't happen, but I just think that it shouldn't be done in isolation from the other areas that, uh, or outside of the participation. You probably have a 50-50 split in this town between people who would like this kind of recreation and find it enjoyable and quality of life and those who don't. And I think that the community ought to be as hard as that discussion would be. I think that's an appropriate thing to have. Any other discussion? I've got some comments from chat. It, um, it, it, do you know, I mean, I, I can't disagree with Doug there at all. Um, it's, it seems like this is really uh, the beginning of the conversation and not the end. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's definitely a larger issue and I think it all needs to be addressed. Um, but I also think it's important that um, we, yeah, I mean, Kirsten took the time to come and tell us about this and, and speak about her experiences. And I, um, I personally don't have a problem with addressing this one area tonight with keeping in mind that many more need to be addressed. Any other discussion? Is there a general theme to what's been posted, Brian? You've been watching the uh, chat line? Two broad topics. Um, you know, the questions about, see, Diana had asked if reclassifying it would have an effect um, that would depend on state law. Our local ordinance does not address trails. Uh, their access to class four is also affected by state law rather than our individual, uh, our local ordinance. Um, let's see, uh, comments about, you know, we have to, Think about the complaints that we're seeing now when we talk about uh, Railroad Street and Main Street. Uh, complaints about noise. Uh, questions about enforcement. How are we going to enforce the law? Uh, complaints about noise. Uh, agreement with Doug. I'm sorry if I'm missing some of this. You can just read them, I think, yeah, Brian. <laughs> oh, there, there's quite a few. Um, 
you know. Yeah, if we can just get a general census, what's uh, being said? Um, Margo, uh, Jackie agrees with Margo's point, uh, talks about, um, you know, seeing a number of box trucks and other large vehicles parked uh, around that could be bringing folks in to use our roads and trails with ATVs. Um, yeah, a lot of, uh, I, I'd say mostly noise complaints. You have quite a few of those. And uh, uh, Kirsten has her hand up again. Uh, so Marco also asked about branding twice. Um, Brand, oh, uh, sorry, I missed that one. Um, Margo had said, uh, what, aren't we trying to brand the town as an ATV destination uh, with mm -hmm. our agreement to allow ATVs uh, in our, uh, along Railroad Road Street to allow with state's agreement on Main Street uh, in the downtown? I don't think the board's ever had that discussion. Uh, we, it's all been very piecemeal, what we've approved or, or haven't approved. We, I think we discussed branding more in terms of the arts and our natural resources in the past. Yes, we've had that discussion. Yes. Yeah. So, and, Brian, and you said Kristen's got her hand up? Yes. Why don't you let her speak? Okay, go ahead. Regarding the noise, I just wanted to say that the rules allow them to be up to 80 decibels, which is as loud as a lawnmower. And if you have a group of them, they are very loud, like the, the loudness is beyond. And the hours, as early as 7 a.m. and as late as 11 p.m., other people are saying they're getting woken up in the middle of the night. Now, can we imagine this going through our town? Um, that's a question. How do we feel about that in our town? And in the back, on the back roads in the, in the nat beautiful, natural, peaceful environment. So yeah, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Is the board prepared to vote on the motion of the 15 mile an hour reduction on whole ag road? Looks like we are. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. And the chair votes nay. Motion fails. Uh, we have to do a roll call if it's not unanimous. Okay. Roll call. Nat, how do you vote? Yes. Carl, how do you vote? Yes. Doug, how do you vote? Nay. And the chair votes nay. Request for management of journeys in. So we had a similar complaint from a neighboring residents to journeys end that, um, you know, that, that where individuals are accessing journeys end overnight, camping there, a lot of litter, uh, loud noises and uh, will are, uh, are being disruptive to the neighbors of that area. Uh, and they're asking if, uh, also saying that there's folks coming down there with, uh, you know, in excess of large groups gathering, not using masks, not practicing social distancing. And they're asking if we will take more active management in uh, overseeing that area to try and uh, put a stop to those activities. Who would we have for enforcement of something like this? Conservation? Conservation uh, does go out there. Uh, they do, they are the ones who pick up a lot of the garbage and, and uh, uh, take care of the trail, take care of the site, and they do a very good job with it. Um, would our, um, our constables be able to help out with this? Most, I mean, 
our constables, we don't have a good system for our constables to get involved in something like this. Uh, they could, I think our constables could write a ticket for the state's littering ordinance, littering uh, laws, but that's not really what we normally use them for. We don't normally use them to enforce state law. Uh, the sheriff's department is reluctant to, th they'll respond to an emergency or something, but they're not going to go for the, the hike from uh, Plot Road all the way down to the waterside uh, just with, without being called for an emergency, without being told that they have to go down for some particular reason. Um, Is uh, is that area got our COVID nineteen postings with you know social distancing and masks and all the that? Trailhead again, make sure that everything's still up. But it we have put everything there. Okay. Um, Linda Hill says in chat, uh, "Can we have a sign that says if you bring it in, take it out?" That's another one that I think has been there in the past. Um, you know, we don't have particularly, most of the signs that we've put up are paper. Uh, we've put up some laminated signs with COVID-19 more recently, but um, yeah, we'll make sure signage is up to date. Uh, I mean, I think this is like the, the whole ATV. 99% of the people could be, you know, abiding by the rules and, and being neighborly and all that, but it's that 1% that We'll ruin it for everyone else. Um, I don't know how we police it. Can we hear from conservation mission folks that are on? If they do, feel we have anyone on tonight, Brian? Um, I'm here. I see I Lois. See Lois on here. Lois, I'm going to unmute your mic. Okay, go ahead, Lois. Okay. Um, I guess I, I, first, I guess I'll address the fact that um, you mentioned there's a COVID, the COVID signs are up. Um, they have been. I'm not sure where they were, but it, I know that there's one that's on a tree on the far edge of the property, which is a place where folks shouldn't even be going. I've never, I check um, Journey's End on a regular basis and haven't seen that post on the kiosk. So I think that, you know, if you could, if I could pick up some signs, I'd be happy to take them up and put them up in the right place. But it's, it's hard to address that if the signs aren't up. But secondly, who's picking up all this trash? When I get up there, there's not very much to pick up. I, I always kind of thought it was you. I'd been out there and I'd seen garbage, and then when I come back with a garbage bag, it's already gone. I think that's Jackie's doing. She's very. Yeah, Jack, Jackie, in, you know, she's part of the commission and the River Conservancy. We've assigned somebody to each of the places. So, as far as trash being around there, there may be something along the side of the road, but there's stuff along the side of the road at my house. It's got nothing to do with. It. Where did this come from, Brian? Exactly. Uh, from some of the neighbors. Uh, it was from uh, Jeff Russin in, in particular. Okay. Are they on the call tonight? I don't see him on the call. Um, okay. You know, unless he's sharing somebody's account. Um, overnight camping seems like it would be a serious concern um, and, and not all that difficult to catch some, you know, it's t tough to catch somebody in the act of littering, um, usually, I think. It's, it's a lot easier to catch somebody who's, who's sleeping there overnight. I wonder if we could 
at least take down some license plates um, and report that to the sheriff for them to follow up on or or even just you know find somebody else to confront them confronting them doesn't seem like a bright idea and, and but, i would not want any of our town employees or or volunteers right. to confront any of we as soon as I said it, I realized confronting people. Yeah, you know, as soon as I said it, I realized it wasn't a smart thing. Um, but getting license plate numbers at least, um, and, and and monitoring, you know, drive by somebody on a Friday night, Saturday night. Is is that? You know, maybe I'm asking Laura. Is that posting thing allowed? I'm sorry. Is it, it po is it posted that there's no overnight camping allowed? I'm pretty sure that it is. We, okay. we had some folks up there a couple of years ago and we picked it up because they were, you know, we saw the, the car for a few days and we uh, told them that they could and they left. It wasn't a problem. But um, unless someone tells us that there's cars over there overnight, and you can't drive by early in the morning and think that they've been there overnight because the fishermen go down early. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, Doug, the ones this weekend didn't catch anything. <laughs> and it's August. But I think that the people who are, are, are up there and see things um, could report. We, maybe we need to tell them who they should report to. Yeah. Well, do we have, I mean, I'm not aware of any ordinance or restriction that we have adopted that the sheriff's office would be able to use against someone that was um, overnight camping. I don't believe that we do have anything that would, you know, I don't think that we have anything adopted that would, strictly speaking, prohibits public land, you know, a, a common one is dawn to dusk. I don't think we've adopted anything like that. Well, we had the sheriff's office move someone along from Beard Park who was camped there for a week or so. Yes, and Legion Field when someone was camped there. So uh, what's the difference? I think the difference in those is kind of length of time more than anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can order somebody to leave public property if they are a nuisance or, or disruptive, but uh, single overnight parking without a request from us, I think might be harder for them uh, to undertake. Well, Journey's End does not have any facilities for to accommodate overnight camping. So we Certainly don't want people up there camping overnight. No. So maybe is the answer just an education piece that we put the signage up at the tree, the, uh, uh, the trailhead, the that, trailhead space, um, the COVID nineteen pandemic and no overnight camping. Make sure that's posted. Yeah. And carry out what you carry in. Those. Yeah, we those. we have those, and the fact is. In all the times I've been down there, I've there's hardly anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This morning there was a a container from um, Jolly's in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. and the fireplace was totally cleaned up with rocks put over. I'd never seen it so pristine. Mm -hmm. But um, it it really is a group of responsible people. One of the big things up there is the parking, because there can be as many as a dozen cars up there, but they've gotten, so they, they pull in the way Brian made the, the parking lot. You have a good, goodly amount of space to, to um, pull in and then they park along the street and they, they do fairly well, but I don't know. Okay, what's Ford's pleasure here? You wanna take any action? I personally don't want to, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I personally am not interested in more active management other than getting our signage clear and, um, and then just 
yeah, um, encouraging folks to, you know, um, clean up when they see something, you know. I know for myself, when I take my daughters to Beard's swimming hole almost every day, and I always bring a little plastic bag with me to pick up stuff that I might see along the way. And I'm also so impressed how clean Beard's has been. So um, I think in general, the community is really good about cleaning up. Beards, is, beards could use a haircut if Brian's still on the call. Yes, I do agree with that. <laughs> it's like bushwhacking to get there right now. Yeah. Okay, I'm sensing the boards just wanting to put some signage up there and we're going to move on. Yeah. Can I get, can I get the, the COVID signs from you, Brian? Do you, do you have them at the office? or? I can get some I signs. I think we would like to laminate them. Uh, so I'm going to work with Lisa Cruz on this. So um, you, I, and Lisa will be in touch and we'll get whatever signage we're going to put up there for the COVID and for the, uh, you know, no overnight camping. Okay. That may be on the, the signage that we have. I just don't remember. I haven't looked at it for a while. Yeah. But, I'd, but if it's not, I can, I can add it on my computer. Yeah, I don't remember yeah. what's there. Uh, and yeah, I think most of what I, if I recall right, most of what I've seen is, isn't laminated. So it, you know, needs to be replaced from time to time. Okay, what we had up there was on the kiosk, it's laminated. Okay. Good, thank you. Can I ask a uh, question, Brian? Go ahead, Doug. Are we allowed to, or would it be proper to post no overnight parking at, at our, or is that, don't, wouldn't that be consistent with our ordinances? I don't think that would be there because it's not an actual, we've just uh, kind of beefed up the shoulder a little bit to make it a little bit easier to pull out of the traveled way of the road, but it's not it's still on street parking. Uh, we could designate it as uh, no overnight parking, uh, but it would be, it'd be a little bit different, but we could. I think it's, I think we, not for now, but I think uh, along, as time goes along, we will be, more people will be using our recreational opportunities and we, should probably think about uh, signage like that for management and to prevent clashes with locals, uh, houses and things like that. I'm not suggesting it now, but I, I think at different trailheads and things, you're gonna have build up in parking and we might wanna consider that. I've suggested that we expand some parking near trailheads and uh, perhaps overnight parking would be uh, a, a reasonable restriction there or a prohibition against it. Yes, I, I think so. I think that it would be, uh, yeah, I'm seeing uh, Diana Osborne in chat, uh, you know, that this is the tip of another I iceberg. Um, and yeah, I tend to agree that I, I think that we would probably be, we'd probably have a better time with enforcement if we were ever challenged, if we developed a a little bit more comprehensive parking plan. Um, and I know we've had requests from, uh, this mostly gets into village parking. Uh, we've had requests about overnight parking on, uh, during the winter and, and other times when, uh, when, when parking becomes more difficult to access because of uh, snow removal. So, yeah, I think that this is something that warrants another look. Put it on our list. Yeah. Which we're going to have to, to, Matt was the uh, driver of it, but I think at some we're point. We're going to revisit that master to list that. tune. Yeah. Okay. Uh, resolution for support of Old Mill Trailhead. I don't know if Doug wants to lead yeah. on this. Yeah, that's me, I think. Um, 
Deborah and Ted Alexander had been uh, summering in in Johnson for about 46 years, and Ted died uh, in I think November, uh, towards the end of last 2019. On uh, June 23rd, I received correspondence from Deborah, who who lives in Calgary, that she and her family were thinking about doing a memorial to Ted. Um, in making in some form a substantial contribution. So, uh, and she asked specifically about the rail trail because that was important to Ted and he used it a lot. Uh, they're quite an adventuresome couple. They had uh, been to Antarctica and traveled uh, all over the world and bicycled. Um, the, uh, she asked me about a contribution to the rail trail, could I investigate that? Uh, I told her, I replied to her and said that uh, the state had just procured nearly $14 million to build out the rail trail. Um, I said I would contact, and I tried to contact the uh, head of the uh, Friends of the uh, Lamola Rail Trail. I didn't get any response from them. And, and on the, the, I wrote back to her on July 9th, and I suggested that perhaps she would, uh, uh, well, with, with the expansion of the rail trail and the funding of it, uh, um, would she be interested in, in funding the, the trailhead, the, the shelter that we have there, if, if we had a, a proposal for that? Um, she wrote back and it essentially said that she, would, she was interested, they had some other potential projects uh, that they were, were thinking about. Um, I told her that, you know, I called Eric and I called Brian's story and, and I might, might have, I think I've talked to Matt and uh, um, Kyle and uh, I put together kind of an ad hoc committee to, to try to put some flesh on, on a proposal. Uh, and the committee was Brian, uh, Lisa Cruz, myself, Howard Romero and, and Leah, all of all of the Lisa Cruz because of the uh, connection to the Old Mill Park and the obvious recreational component there. Um, and we had a meeting down there I, on, at, at the trailhead on the on the I think the sixth of August. We wrote back. I wrote back to Deborah and and described and that is uh, my letter to Deborah and her response to me. Uh, her response indicating that she's, she's quite interested, she is cons would like to know what the funding would be, and she asked me, uh, when I responded to her, I asked her, would she like me to check with the select board on whether or not my assumption that we would be willing to uh, dedicate, if, if, if we worked out an agreement then, would we be willing to have a dedication of this building with his Ted's name on it, maybe a picture and a bio, okay? Um, and so that's what's in front of you tonight is, is whether the, the town of Johnson would be agreeable in concept to formulating a plan for improvements to the Johnson Trailhead on the rail trail, uh, and if an agreement can be worked out, can be reached with the family of Ted Alexander, Ted Alexander with regard to a financial contribution for the project, to the town dedicating the project and the trailhead to Ted with uh, biographical information for him and, and a picture. So essentially, it's kind of like naming rights for a stadium in, in exchange for a contribution. Uh, I would say that I think that even if this doesn't pan out, it would be useful to have, given what I see on the rail trail now, to have a uh, something some thought at this point in time to think about making our our shelter more comfortable, more accessible, more reasonable, more uh, interesting to to the public, to the traveling public. I think it's uh, it, it's building infrastructure that would be used and be helpful to us. So that's my theory or statement. Thank you, Doug. Board member thoughts. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, we initially built that trailhead facility with, with an eye toward eventually building it out more so that it would have full, you know, 
working year round toilets and, and things like that. So um, I think it would be absolutely wonderful. A um, few points on it. Um, number one, I really want to be careful and very deliberate that we have a very uh, robust public input period or, you know, just that there, we get plenty of public input. There are a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different uses of that, um, of that facility. So getting a lot of public input. And I, I think when we initially built it, we didn't do a good enough job of, of collecting input from the public and really listening and, and making it um, reflect the input that we collected. Second, um, along with create with getting the the estimates to build it, I um, I also at the same time would like to know what the estimates are um, for annual maintenance. Um, I assume this there would be an on, ongoing costs related to uh, cleaning it, cleaning and maintenance. Um, and my only other thought on it, well, my other thought on it is that this will put more pressure on us to redevelop that intersection, redesign that intersection of, of Railroad Street and Lendway Lane that is um, not very uh, user friendly right now. So those are my thoughts, Doug. Thank you. Kyle? Well. Yeah, um, agreed that that space has so much potential. Um, and absolutely needs more uh, TLC. Um, I've been kind of uh, bummed out that when I go to, when I take a walk or take the dog for a walk around Old Mill Park, that the water for drinking does, has, has not worked all summer. So um, maybe we can get that taken care of before this project happens, if it does happen. But yeah, so I think that, I think it would be great to, to um, uh, make it more than what it is. Um, I think it's also important that we see it in the bigger context of what what our vision is for Old Mill Park. Um, as, as a park, um, it's clearly one of our more beautiful ones and I think it, it, it in and of itself has a lot of potential um, in terms of how to bring, yeah, the trails and the arts and all of that together. So, um, uh, so this is sort of, this idea is also, I think it's going to propel us, I, I, I hope, my wish is that it'll propel us into thinking more about the, the bigger plan of that, of that park and it, and the whole potential. So, um, yes, in concept, I, I, I definitely would support this. So I'm, I'm going to ask, uh, it sounds like there's support for the project. Is there support for the request? the uh, structure be named in the honor of the uh, the donor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they're looking for a resolution, Doug? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for something that I can bring to them, you know, kind of what I had stated before that we're agreeable in concept, you know, to basically to the, the operative words, which you dedicating the, you know, um, if we can reach an agreement with the family, we're agreeable in concept to their uh, be are dedicating the trailhead to Ted Alexander with his name, a picture, and, and a little and a bio on it. You know, and, th and that that would have to you know we have to know what the project is. They need to know costs. They need to know timelines. Uh, you know, they don't want to you know just pick up what's in the sack, a pig in a poke, you know, they want to understand and, and we want to know what we're doing. So they're, uh, but they, I think it's important to them. They really feel part of this community and it's important to them. Uh, they're doing this as a memorial. So that's the piece for them. Okay. Carl, you had something? Yeah. I was just wondering, um, have they expressed how much involvement with actual design planning of the kiosk they want? I have? haven't heard. I haven't heard them request anything to do with that. I've heard them, you know, interested in cost and uh, and and the the naming rights essentially, the memorial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, I'd be interested in in knowing how much involvement they want to have on in in just in terms of ability, look, feel, that kind of thing. That's important to me. Well, that would be part of uh, if we can, if an agreement can be reached. You know, we certainly could ask them that. But uh, you know, basically, tonight I'm after you know if we can reach an agreement with them for a project yet to be determined, would we be willing to uh, uh, dedicate this to them in exchange for the a contribution for this agreed upon plan? Yeah. To be agreed upon plan. Understood, yeah. So what's the board's pleasure? Is they, are we prepared to adopt the resolution? Uh, we do have some public comment before we uh, have a vote or anything. Okay, um, I'm, I guess I'm looking for from the board if you even going to uh, make a motion to adopt the resolution, then we could open it up as part of the discussion. Yeah, sorry, I, I lost track of where we were at in the process. I would ask Doug to make the motion if you're willing, Doug. Yeah, I would make a motion that the town of Johnson be con be agreeable to the concept of formulating a plan for improvements to the Johnson Trailhead on the rail trail, and if an agreement can be reached with the family of Ted Alexander with regard to a financial contribution for the project uh, to the town dedicating the project trailhead to Ted Alexander with his name, to carry his name, picture, and a biography. Thank you, Doug. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Doug, you may want to send that motion to Donna if she didn't catch it all. Yep. If there's any comments from the uh, the audience now. Okay, Walter, um, getting you now. Okay, go ahead, Walter. Thank you. Um, having been involved in some major capital contributions that are very similar to this, what you are discussing, uh, capital campaigns for charitable organizations. I want to make sure you are very clear on what you are doing. And I have a definite opinion on what you are doing or not doing. There are naming rights and there is a dedications. Okay. They are definitely different. Naming rights carries very deep and important legal ramifications that will stick with that property possibly forever. Dedication is just putting up a little plaque saying this quote, building was built or sponsored by or from a contribution by the family, okay? And there's a very distinct difference between naming a shelter, naming a quote unquote building versus we are just dedicating this building or thanking this person for contributing to this building, okay? And right now your quote, uh, motion is very confusing on what you're exactly doing and if you are going to be naming this you need to really stop slow down and examine what you are doing because that carries a lot of legal ramifications for the long term and now what are you going to start doing about all your other parks and all your other buildings you ought to have a policy so I want to make sure you are very clear on what you are doing um, I mean, I was involved with a $10 million campaign with the Green Mountain Club. We had these same discussions in terms of shelters and bridges and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a distinct difference between naming a building, naming a shelter, and putting up a little plaque saying, thank you very much for, for helping to fund this project. So right now your motion is all over the place and I think you really need to back up and just, you know, it's one thing to just explore this, it's another thing to start just crossing around names and plaques. So I'm very serious here that I think you really need to back up here. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Is there anyone else? Uh, yes. Uh, go ahead, Leah. Um, yes, um, thank you. I just want to say that I am in support of the proposal and you know from a couple of conversations I had with Doug and being a part of this ad hoc committee meeting um, it's my understanding that 
the Alexanders, you know, they are eager to proceed. And at the same time, they also have some other ideas for how to spend their money. Um, so I would like to think that we can respond with something specific to them in terms of the design. Um, I acknowledge Kyle's feedback about the need for the public input. Um, so, so, so hopefully we can get some of that in. But I also want to be sensitive to, the, to like not losing this opportunity because it does not happen to Johnson every day or every year even that somebody comes forth and wants to make a donation to make something better. Um, so, you know, in launching into widespread public discussions, I just want to be cautious of there being only a certain time to it after which they may lose interest is my understanding. And also, um, is my understanding that they are looking for an image of what we are proposing, and actually Howard Romero is working to sketch something out based on the thoughts that have been brought forth. Thank you, Leah. Yeah. If I may, um, we can. I mean, there's an ad hoc committee going. I, I don't know how much. Of authority and we haven't created it from the select board it is ad hoc um but they could very well go forward very quickly with um announcing public meetings or or soliciting um written input um on on what that space needs there's just there's a wide um variety of users from from snow machiners to equestrians and, and everything in between. Um, and, and we get into trouble when we don't, when we aren't rigorous about getting public input. So I, I don't think it needs to delay the process. I think it could be going very, very soon if the people involved would, would, would make it happen. Thank you, Nat. Doug, did you want to address Walter's concerns? Yeah. Um... He certainly has more experience in in the fundraising than I do. Um, I would what Deborah Alexander was talking to me about was naming rights, you know, for a contribution. If we decide that we would accept it, they would have the naming rights to that. That's for a project that they would decide they would advance money for, and we would decide that we would accept their money and exchange for the naming rights. So my, my motion, I guess, would be with regard specifically to naming rights. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, I had a, a, Howard is back and said that he has drawn, drawn sketches and we certainly could, uh, you know, have, the com have this ad hoc committee meet, say, did, did this, uh, a, a, did this address what we are, has it, does it include what we were talking about? And then we could take it uh, uh, about, take it to the public and say, here's what's proposed, what do you think? Um, but right, as far as to, to Leah's point about uh, you know, an opportunity, uh, I, I think that uh, the, Deborah had not asked me what are you going to do. She said if you if you do something and we we are making a contribution that's agreeable to you, would we have naming rights? That's what I asked her if I should bring that to the to the board because uh, every the that's a decision for the board, you know, as well as the plan. We're we're just trying to create something that could be looked at, and so this is that's the first step that's important to them. Okay, do we have any other comments? I've got a couple comments from the chat. Uh, 
Yeah, Scott and Kim, uh, I, I think it's safe to say that Scott and Kim support this. Uh, let's see, Diana Osborne says, isn't Johnson about the center? Maybe we could consider having a campsite at the park for people doing the whole route. Um, I assume she's talking about the, the rail trail. Um, you know, and that might be especially necessary uh, if we start making changes to overnight parking uh, in other areas around uh, town and our other recreation facilities. And Rick Opperly suggests that we should open this up to a larger public conversation. Um, yes, uh, as somebody who has helped out with this a little bit, um, I think that yeah, we get these drawings from Howard and I think that we can publish them and ask for some public comment on them. Um, we can work on a little kind of a survey or something to make it a little bit easier to assemble some of the data, possibly have a Zoom meeting to discuss it at another date. Um, I do wanna be clear that this is not so far it's not a committee convened by the select board. It's just a group of private citizens who are interested in this and are seeking permission from the select board, kind of weighing the interest of the select board and seeking permission to continue forward with it. But it will be the select board's decision. Uh, it's like we're not granting any authority to the group to act. And I, I think I would interpret uh, the way the motion was crafted and the resolution is we will entertain this in the future, but we're not committing yet. Yes. To anything. Go ahead, Nat. I would encourage that ad hoc group again, just start getting um, start that public conversation and start getting input from everyone, documented on front porch forum, getting written feedback. It's, it's tougher to, to, to do meetings uh, in person this summer, but um, we, we really need to do that. And I, I understand that the time is sensitive, but time's of, of the essence, but, uh, but it's an essential part of the process. Yep. Okay, is the board prepared to uh, vote and adopt this resolution? Yes. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion to adopt passes. Letter of opposition to the act relating to promoting affordable housing. So, uh, LCT and LCPC have uh, are both submitting letters uh, in opposition to S-237, an act relating to promoting affordable housing. The central complaint that uh, a lot of the organizations have and that I have about this act is uh, that it is applying Burlington standards to the rest of the state. Uh, that you know, it's applying, um, it, it's reducing our local control and uh, impacting our ability to govern ourselves. Um, so I, I, I am interested in asking the select board to, to oppose it. Uh, it's less about the contents than less about the specifics of the bill and more about its impact on local governance. Did everyone have an opportunity to read the, the letter that Duncan sent out with the LCPC's position? No. I didn't actually. That would have been yeah. super helpful for context. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, I have been scrambling all weekend to figure out, make heads or tails of what what this is about. Um, did that get sent out? I, I did he send it, it yeah. to just you and I, Brian, or? Maybe. Uh, I didn't um, see who was in the the send list. I gotta stop the sharing in order to look at my email. And I'm not sure if Leah felt 
would feel if she's still on comfortable talking to it. But as I understand, LCPC is taking a strong position against it. Uh, VLCT has also, and, and again, the, the central problem with it is its impact on, on local control for both organizations. And it looks like, uh, I apologize that the board was not copied on the earlier conversation. Maybe we could have Leia speak to it. Is that possible? Is she still on, Brian? Uh, let's see her. No, she's not. Okay. Because I reached out to Lamoille Housing Project because I was curious, since this has to do with housing and housing equity, what their opinion was on it. And I also reached out to Dan Noyes because I was just trying to figure out why on earth we'd want to oppose something that seems to be protecting uh you know housing our, our most vulnerable populations and and making sure that there is affordable housing for folks so um and lhp got back to me and said back in june they did they they were in support of this bill actually um but Dan says that according to the Speaker of the House, it's very unlikely that this bill will even get to the floor because the budget is the priority and not so much about policy changing and that it's still in committee and it could, this, the whole thing could look really, really different by the time it gets to the floor if it does get to the House floor. So, um, so we might not need to take action tonight if, if we can get a little stronger, what the LCPC and, and the league's yeah. positions are and why they have them and share that with the full board, that might be good. Yeah, we'll do a little bit more background on this before we move forward. Um, yeah, it is, it, it's in, it's passed from the Senate to the House and yeah, it's not the highest priority item in the House right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. I think we've got a little bit of time. I had a conversation with Duncan Hastings. I also had a long conversation with uh, Dan Noyes. Uh, my understanding is uh, ex extrapolating out to considering this on a national level. This is like about housing in San Francisco and Los Angeles, places that are unaffordable. It's about bringing in infill housing or to create affordable housing. When you translate that to like considering if, and uh, if you have a, water system or a septic system uh, municipal, then you, are, then you are automatically zoned to certain sizes. So for instance, if you're Lake Elmore and you have a, you have a uh, camp there, your, your sizes of your lots will be automatically decreased. So our, our municipal uh, form-based code would, would be, would have this state adopted zoning requirement stuffed into it. Um, and it's all about for a wonderful position of uh, or purpose of creating affordable housing. But it's, it's not really, doesn't translate to this type of a community. And instead it creates problems for us. That's the basic understanding of what I had. I think that's very well said, Doug. Would it be I, I don't see why we couldn't wait because to Kyle's point, uh, if the house is not going to act on it right off, then waiting until we get more information. Well, I had that conversation with Dan too about acting. You know, it, it's on the wall. It may or may not be taken off the wall. This is a this is an end run around, as I understand, it's an end run around the opposition that happened in Chittenden County to attempts to amend their zoning. So they are trying to do it through the legislature by making it a statewide rule. So you know, it got through the Senate because Chittenden County has six representatives. You know, of, of and uh, you bring it down to the house and uh, it's a crapshoot. You know, will it come off the wall? I asked Dan, you know, he actually doesn't think it will, 
but uh, he can't guarantee. And he said, if it does, he'll be following it and, and checking on it. But, uh, you know, and I, I don't know what effect a letter from us would be, but, you know, I don't see any harm in sending it. And, and it's a complete no brainer for me right now. I, I guess it sort of comes down to you, Nat and Kyle, what's your comfort level? Um, there's, I haven't gotten much information about it at all, other than what's in our agenda. Mm -hmm. um, it's clearly, it's way more complicated than I'm going to be able to learn the ins and outs of and the complexities of in the next five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not prepared to make, make a, uh, a stand on this one way or the other tonight. I'd be happy to come back to it in two weeks after talking to people about it. Yeah, I uh, I have been trying to get to, to get more information about it, and I'm still feeling ambivalent about strongly stand, taking a stance one way or the other. When one, it may look really different when it comes actually out to the house um, after it's been in committee. And according to Dan, the conversation I had with him, they are trying to work out their different the, the grievances of the BLCT. So. Um, so yeah, I feel like giving it a little more time would be good because I, I certainly don't want to be opposing something that, um, is going against our anti-racism commitment statement, which says we are going to be working with legislators to, to, you know, uh, to better their position in this world and not make it worse. <laughs> Okay, why don't we come back to that, Brian, and if you can get some more information on LCPC's position and the league, sure. that could be helpful. No problem. I'll, I'll do a little bit more infilling on, on our information on this one. Uh, we do have public comments here. Okay. All right, Walter, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I actually did a whole lot of research on this over the weekend. And my feeling is you should be taking a stand on this, strongly in supporting this bill. Um, this right here is a letter from the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition of which the Memorial Housing Partnership is a member. And bottom line, it was to the chairs of the, the, of the Senate, which did pass this bill 28 to nothing. So there's a whole lot of communities other than Chittenden County supporting this. Um, bottom line is the whole point of this bill is a um, equity, um, inclusion, diversity issue. And we have come out and stated and come forth and said this is important to us. And land management, land policies is something towns and villages and the state do. And we need to step forward and say, this is important that these bills that support equity, that support diversity, that support inclusion should be given due diligence and should be given a chance to come forward to correct systematic biases that have been going on. I mean, bottom line, that was B8, uh, the Vermont, Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition standpoint was that zoning is a systematic bias. And thus we have created these problems over the years through our zoning. Um, you Google it right now, you will probably get endless searches. Uh, Minneapolis, even before George Floyd recognized this and has been rewriting their zoning laws. Right now, if you Google it, New York City pops to the top because they are rewriting their zoning rules again to address this same issue. And what really galled me was, if you read the latest, quote, newsletter from VLCT, they have an article in there from Susanna Davis of the, uh, you know, the State Racial Equity Committee talking about systematic bias. But yet VLCT seems to be just ignoring their article in their own magazine. 
you even, I strongly even recommend you read the executive director's letter on page two. She talks about systematic bias. And right now we have BLCT basically saying, um, excuse me, we're gonna continue systematic bias. And this law, which quote, allows systematic bias to stand. I looked at this law, I compared it to our form-based code. Realistically, it's not gonna affect us at all. We'll have to do some minor rewrites to comply with the law, but when I get all said and done, it doesn't affect us at all. Um, I mean, the beauty of form-based code is the more these things pop up, the more I realize form-based code is a heck of a tool um, because it ultimately does not get into these multifamily housing units. We just, what is the envelope? Um, we, so we, there'd be some minor tweakings we'd have to do, but when we get all said and done, it does not affect us at all. So I didn't have any heartburn when I read, there's the law. And when I read the law, I said, it doesn't affect us. Minor rewrites, we'll get around to it. Um, I hear VLCT's comments, Duncan's comments. You know, when I read this, I said, okay, if you want to influence behavior, you can use a carrot or a stick. This is definitely a stick. I won't disagree with that comment. This is definitely a stick, but I think it's a good stick. Um, and if we're gonna get serious about addressing systematic bias in how we govern, then this law should be something we should look at strongly and should be supporting. And to a certain extent, we should be telling VLCT, I mean, the word hypocrite just wants to jump out of my mouth. Um, reading VLCT's newsletter and at the same time reading that, their comments on this law. So I'm of the opinion that you should be coming out strongly in favor of this law and as a member of these VLCT telling them, uh, excuse me guys, um, we've got to get with the times here, including VLCT, and be looking at these things differently. Um, so I really think you need to be looking at it as well in light of our inclusivity statement. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Do we have anyone else, Brian? Uh, I've got a couple of questions from chat. Uh, let's see, Beth says uh, that she agrees with Walter about not following VLCT or other organizations without fully understanding. Uh, I think that's what we're talking about doing tonight, uh, Beth, that we want a little bit more information um, about some of the details here. Uh, then Jackie uh, asked a point of clarification, where did the recommendation for the town to write a letter proposing this bill come from? Um, LCPC uh, is one, uh, Duncan Hastings, our representative for LCPC is another, and VLCT uh, also have, have all come out in opposition of it. So yes, so I, I feel strongly that I, I need to see those. <laughs> I need to see those letters. Sure. Um, otherwise, it feels a little bit like stabbing in the dark here. But, but to Walter's point, and I, that's, he did it more eloquently than I did, but I just, yeah, I feel like there's no way that I would ever support something that is moving us in the wrong direction in terms of um, housing equity and, uh, you know, systemic racism. So, um, yeah, so we really need to get, we need to get clear. All right. So, um, uh, I'll share the information and we'll take this up again in September. Okay. I think we probably can move on to the next article. Item update to the memorandum. Yep. So the MOU from the village. Uh, we, I got some comments back from the village, and I think this is a good opportunity uh, for taking this up uh, with our uh, with the the joint meeting coming up on. Um, Next, uh, that'll be our next topic, is when the joint meeting is coming up, but I'd like to revisit the MOU and try and move that forward. Uh, 
let's see, the village had asked for a couple changes. Give me a second to grab this. Let's see, one they had asked for was changing some of the terminology for um, where, where we said partner. Let's see. No. Uh, where we said party in the MOU uh, and where we said town and village, cleaning that up, getting that a little bit more uh, consistent throughout the plan. Um, working on excuse me, working on a date for um, when we had to turn in uh, changes in, in the wage calculation about how much was shared between town and village and um, making it explicit that each party uh, had to, uh, if the agreement was dissolved, that each party would have to pay for 100% of their employees. Um, I think it makes sense for us to adopt their requested change on cleaning up the language about party or town and village. That was pretty easy. I think it's a good idea for us to adopt. It's okay for us to adopt the language about uh, that we each, the MOU is being dissolved, that we would each be solely responsible for our employees. Although I don't think that's strictly speaking necessary because if we don't have an MOU, then we would uh, not have an agreement to share the cost. Uh, and I also don't think it's necessary to put a date on when uh, the wage, I don't think it's necessary to tie the date uh, where wage negotiation happens with the agreement uh, because I think that any discussion about changing the wage calculation would have to come before the new agreement is signed. <laughs> So I don't think that that I don't think that that discussion could come up uh, midstream, except in an ex extraordinary circumstance. And if we did have some kind of extraordinary circumstance, we might want the freedom to be able to deal with it. Um, the amendments can only happen by the agreement of both bodies. So I think it's pretty reasonable for us to just assume that we would not both agree to something unless it was extraordinary circumstances in which case we would probably appreciate the flexibility to be able to address it. So the wage question, is that if one or the other was going to give an increase? It's not. It's the, uh, if you're called the percentage share of each employee. Yeah. It's been the same for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And there's been some interest in, you know, uh, is, is that fair? Are we really, uh, is everybody's time really split that way between town and village? I don't see how we can realistically evaluate that until all of the dust settles with all of the staffing swizzles that have happened. Yep. So are they proposing to push that date out? No, they would like it, they'd like to specify in there that we would do that in uh, November or December before the new agreement is signed on January 1st. And would, would my thought be... is just we could stay silent on that because except in extraordinary circumstances, we wouldn't make changes to those except when we were signing a new agreement. And I would go back to, will it, realistically know by then October November what this year no yeah because 
I mean, I, she's I, been I spending a lot a of her time choice. training a village employee and and working for the town and. Yeah, I think that's a future discussion uh, anyway. Right. Uh, but I, even in the future, I don't think we really need to include it. And I can't really imagine, I mean, they're right. I don't think we would ever want to have that discussion except in advance of signing a new agreement. Right. Um, but I, I, I don't see how putting that in there it is to anybody's advantage. Was this going to be a topic for the joint meeting? I'd like to suggest it as a topic for the joint meeting. Okay. Is is the board in agreement on that? And a topic? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, what's the latest? What's the latest text? What's the latest draft of this? Where is it? Yeah. I've got it right here. Let me share it. You can email it, email that out to us. Um, yeah, yeah. Why not? Then we'll be able to be informed going into the joint meeting. No, I apologize. This was cut out of the. Uh, email for later rather than sharing. And sharing would be better. Yeah, it would be. This is not. Not going to be terribly informative because we don't have a whole lot of time to. To read it uh, and yeah, the changes are a little hard to see. Uh, I went through when I was more consistent about how I addressed the two parties that the town and village use that language more often and less less generic language. Um, and added a line under termination. Uh, after termination of this MOU, each party is solely responsible for employee compensation. So changes are relatively small. I think we're close to an agreement. I'd like to bring it up at the uh, at the joint meeting. What's board members thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to get this sent to me so I can, I'm, feel, I'm feeling a little lost, so. <laughs> um, it's been a while since we looked at this. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So, Unless anybody's got any further comments on that, we'll have that mailed out to us. And we can probably move on to the date and agenda items for the joint meeting. Yep. So the trustees have suggested um, the last week in, the last full week in August, so the that's, 24th through the 26th. That's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Yep. What's the board member's availability? Um, I, can, I can do Wednesday the 26th. Okay. Nat, Doug? I can do Monday or Tuesday. I have a CUD meeting on the 26th. Okay. I got nowhere to go. You can do any day? Yeah. I can do any day, preferably Monday, but I can do any day. I, yeah, I can do Monday. I can do Monday. I'll be back in time, coming back from a camping trip, but. Um, I'm sure. Seven o'clock, our usual seven or. Uh, if we're gonna do Monday, doing seven o'clock on Monday would be a lot better for me. Yes, okay. Uh, if we wanna do six o'clock, Tuesday would be better for me. And I can't do Tuesday at, at all. Okay. But I could do Monday at seven. Can you kick that back to uh, I will. Meredith? And you might ask Michael. He's retired. Yeah. He can do any day. 
Um, I'm, I'm we sure don't have a moderator lined up at this time. I, uh, Zoom meetings are going to be very different. I think uh, it'd be very difficult with a moderator for a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Um, if I can be so bold, I might suggest that I've got a pretty good handle on uh, running these, so uh, I might, it might be helpful for I, I could serve that function. I think you could. Uh, yeah, I'm comfortable with that. You know, just in the it, it's hard technology enough. and kind of keeping it functioning, not in a uh, yeah. traditional moderator facilitator role, just. All right. Uh, and the agenda items, um, the only suggestion I have besides the charge for a racial justice committee is the staff MOU. Did the village got any? I was not made aware of any. Okay. Board members think of anything that we've not met with the trustees for some length of time? If you're going to do a charge for the Racial Justice Committee, I think we ought to uh, discuss with them how the members of the committee get selected and who appoints. Yeah, I, I think that would all be under the same topic, but wouldn't it not? I, I would assume so, but let's absolutely make sure it is. Um, just a heads up to our board, I'm going to be recommending that we actually change the name of that committee a little bit just to broaden the scope of work and leave room for broadening the scope of work to something more like social justice and equity issues. Um, because a lot of times these issues, they cross, you know, they cross lines. Um, and I think that would just um, allow a little bit more room for for uh, increased scope of work so i'm going to be bringing that up yep i don't think any of us were hired on a particular name okay the other thing i was wondering about do we feel like this that would be an appropriate time to talk about the merger study a little bit more um if we get anything back we don't okay if we wanted to talk about it with them, um, I would not recommend that as a topic for the same meeting, just for time reasons. Okay. Uh, if that's something we're interested in talking to them about, I think that we should set a, you know, that we, what we might have as a topic for that meeting uh, next week is when to schedule the next joint meeting to talk about the merger study. Um, that I think that that discussion, I think that this discussion is going to be challenging and time consuming. And I think adding another challenging and time consuming to the same meeting would be uh, difficult. Now, we will not need to have a joint meeting to go over, well, yeah, we still will for the benefits package, right? That'll be a same benefits. Uh, I suppose that's something that's really for our um, our MOU. Is I I don't think it cover. I don't think it covers. We're not required to have the same benefits. So we would not necessarily have to have a joint meeting to decide what we are going to cover for health and insurance and stuff like that no but the, the MOU is uh, calendar year uh, is how we set it up um, so because we set it up that way because that was when we used to talk about compensation and, and wages was you know that we would have that set in November and December 
we would we won't be doing wages anymore but i guess my question is would we have a uniform uh, benefits package i don't know it, it would if we did it would have to be by agreement we still i mean we still have two joint employees we also need to work out what to do about uh, Rosemary and uh, now Susan as the assistant town clerk because they are not, Rosemary's an elected position and then she hires her assistant. So they're neither town nor village employees. So that's a potential third category of uh, employee. Yeah, even though we won't have joint employees, we both compensate both of them. Yeah, we both contribute to their compensation. Yeah. Hmm. I, mean, I, I think it would be nice if health and the healthcare benefit could be the same among town and village. Um, for those I two, I think it has to be. I think for them two, we have to be the same because we can't offer 80% coverage and the village offer 90% coverage. I mean, how would that work? Okay, well that answers the question. That requires a joint meeting then, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, it, we should have a joint meeting to discuss their compensation, if nothing else. Um, because that, yeah. Is there anything to discuss on the mill house and the Tetra property? We were, I think we talked about subdividing it at some point to the dividing the house off of the parcel. Where, where, where are we with that? I'll review their notes and, and see. Yeah. And we took that to the, the voters once and the voters uh, shot it down. No, no, that was to sell the land outright. Right. Yeah. We had the recent uh, suggestion for a subdivision of uh, the Tatro property, uh, of the old mill house off of the rest of the mill. Right. I thought Meredith was going to look into that for the trustees, uh, some of the Act 250 questions. I have to review their notes. I'm not sure where they're at on it. And that was quite a while ago when we had a joint meeting and uh, that's months ago at this point. Yeah, I mean, it was almost nine years ago now when I joined the board that um, that was one of my first issues was <laughs> <laughs> House, which is just it's an embarrassment to the community that we we own this derelict building um, it's not particularly i don't think the safest structure in the world for the occupants um so i i don't know i know there's a lot of hot issues but i'd like to you think after nine years you should be able to <laughs> get something done Marta's stop sign ordinance is still out there too. So. <laughs> yeah, that one's even older. Okay, um, unless anybody's got any other uh, items for that joint meeting, I think we're ready to throw that back at them as proposal for the 24th, seven o'clock. Um, before we go into executive session, one of the items uh, that we uh, added was the first Monday of September, our work working meeting is actually falls on Labor Day. Uh, what the board's preference? Do you want to still have it? Do you want to move it? Do you want to not have a working meeting? Move it to Tuesday. Move it to Tuesday. Does everybody agree on that? I can't. I will not be able to do Tuesdays um, because Michael's now teaching at the college Tuesday and Thursday nights. Um, okay. Brian, do we have any thought for what we would have on that agenda yet? Uh, we had several things tonight that we uh, 
Well, Donna's got a conflict on Tuesday too. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, for a working session, it was mostly going to be things from tonight, and I was. I it's pretty rapid turnaround, but I was hoping that I could uh, have the help uh, the the gravel pit up for discussion then. Um, I don't think it, I don't think there's anything for anyone else that's time sensitive. So if we're willing to wait until uh, the sec the regular meeting in September, uh, with possibly a couple things getting pushed to October, um, I think we can manage as long as we're willing to. The board want to skip a meeting for a month. <laughs> There's one thumbs up. <laughs> Doug? Yeah, that's fine. I'm wondering if, if Brian could give us uh, some sort of a, uh, uh, I know a, a written report. C can we have something by the beginning of September about the gravel pit in writings for us? So basically yeah. to see that the work gets done that, that we would have considered? Yeah, I'll, I'll still try and have that out for you uh, in advance of when the meeting would have been. Um, you know, I, I most weekends I, when we don't meet, I have a, a brief update for you, and I'll try and include it with that. Okay. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll have just one meeting in September. Yay. Uh, the study group for the policing uh, affordability. What a, I don't remember what we officially called it. So we've got three volunteers for it that are all highly qualified and we are spoiled for choices. Uh, we have Greg Tatro, uh, Diana Osborne, and Duncan Hastings have all uh, volunteered to serve. Uh, Duncan was not able to make the meeting tonight. Uh, he's traveling, but uh, Greg and Diana are here. Okay. Why don't we uh, give them an the opportunity to speak to the board? Okay, uh, Greg, you've got your camera on, so I unmuted you first. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess I'd be willing to serve on this board. Um, I guess my main concern would be public safety. We'd have to look at uh, whether we're getting what we're paying for, that would be a pretty important, but uh, public safety would be my number one uh, concern. I think, you know, I think Johnson is, uh, needs, needs that. But, uh, you know, I definitely want to look at the numbers to make sure we're getting, getting what we're paying for and see if there's some way to, uh, to uh, save some money for the town. That's for sure. I'm kind of a conservative when it comes to that. So, um, yeah, I think I could, I think I could figure this out pretty, pretty easily. So I don't have too much more to say, but thanks. Thank you, Greg. Do we have Diane? Diana, I'm unmuting you. Okay, go ahead. All right. Hi. Um, my interest in this committee was triggered by um, Matt's invitation because he knows that I work in Lamoille County as a first responder. Um, I'm familiar with the Lamoille County Sheriff's Department and I work very closely, especially with the dispatchers. Um, it's important to me that Johnson uh, look at the financial aspect of the relationship. And I've I guess I'm especially concerned that we um, work together with the other towns too, because it's not just a Johnson issue. And I think that we need to look at what's happening in these surrounding towns as well. Um, I have about 10 years of school board activity and was a founding member of the River Arts Board. And so I'm familiar with working on a variety of boards. And I know that um, what that means is that you rely on people like these committees to collect information and share it with you and then you make the decisions. So I understand I would not be making the decisions, but doing some background research for you um, so that you could then make the best decisions that you can. 
Thank you. I like to research issues, and this is one that's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Board members, you have questions for either one? Um, how many are, sorry, how many folks are we supposed to Two. appoint? Two. Two. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, one, I guess uh, for you, Greg, um, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but um, it's just that Roger, you know, serves on the Jenna's Promise board. Um, and I just, I just uh, wonder about the conflict, the potential conflicts of interest there and just um, uh, wanting to make sure that, it, you know, that you could be objective and, you know, um, and um, yeah, I guess the conflict of interest piece is a little bit, um, raises a little uh, a concern for me. So um, that's one thing. Um, and I'll, you can loop back around to me, I'll let other people speak too, but I have one more thing, but. Greg? Yes, Roger is uh, on the board, but um, that really isn't going to make any difference to me. Um, you know, I'm a resident of Johnson, and uh, like I said, my primary goal will be public safety for the town. I mean, you know, uh, I do think we need law enforcement. Uh, once we dig into the numbers, we might find that maybe we don't need quite as much as we have but uh, I, I want to make sure the public was safe and that's the number one priority tax dollars uh, of course everybody's concerned with that now especially with the COVID and the uh, reduced income that we're going to see so that, it won't be a problem I uh, you guys know me enough that I pretty much tell it the way it is and uh, it, it's just the way I work so but uh, thanks. Anyone else? My question would be, uh, do you think you have time to put into this? To both of them. I don't know, honestly, how much time it's gonna take. Is it just one meeting a month? I'd be fine. Uh, you know, if it's one meeting a week, that might be pushing it some, but... Uh, I, you know, will make time. Matt, do you have any idea what the commitment is? Yeah, the meeting schedule is really just going to be dependent on um, on the members. Uh, we haven't put any solid time uh, timeline in place for deliverables from the commute from the committee. Um, I think there's a rough ex uh, expectation that in a year um, you'll have something for us. Um, that'll give us, um, that'll set us up nicely for budget year, budget discussions that follow, you know, basically a year from now in September, October, November. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I know both other members have mentioned, you know, quirkiness of, of schedules, but it's, it's really going to have to, to work for the six members. Okay, anyone else? Is the board prepared to nominate two candidates? I, uh, are you ready for a motion? Yes. Um, yep, I mean, I definitely don't want to, I, I want to disclose what's already been disclosed from Diana is that I did encourage her to apply for this, someone that I thought of. Um, early on when we were thinking about this because of um, her experiences as a first responder in Morrisville, um, because of her experience um, well, as a long-term resident in Johnson, as a neighbor, um, as a school board member, and uh, especially, in, in not least, but her feedback on the class four roads, which was uh, extensive and very detail-oriented. And I thought that was really uh, telling of the sort of uh, 
anyway, I've, I've talked to Diane about it on the phone and, and uh, she just seems to really kind of, I think, uh, understand what's going on there. Um, uh, Greg, I think his, um, uh, a great candidate because um, he's a business owner. I think he, he runs an organization that's, I think, I don't know this for sure, but I believe that it's roughly the same, uh, his business is roughly the same size as uh, Lamel County Sheriff's Department, at least in the number of employees. Um, the two big drivers of this budget are payroll and equipment. Um, so I think Greg's experience there will be really valuable. Um, uh, it's, it, it's, it's always difficult because of course, Duncan is also a really, uh, very, very qualified candidate. Can't go wrong with, uh, there really, there's no wrong answer here, but I'm going to uh, move that we appoint, uh, Diana and Greg to this committee. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. We have a second. And I would just echo what Nat said. I, I know all three of the, the candidates, uh, certainly Duncan, I've known for many years. He certainly brings a wealth of knowledge. However, I think what Greg and Diane bring is uh, a fresh set of eyes from the outside more. And uh, I think that could be a lot of value there. So I, I'm 100% in support of you two. Anyone else? My thought is that they're highly qualified and I like to see the, our community strengthened by adding new volunteers and broadening our, our, the base of people who are contributing. Not that they don't contribute already, but um, I'm sure we can find something else to tap Duncan straight. I was thinking of that also, but they're not exactly fresh faces. These guys have been working in the community for a number of years and doing a lot of good stuff. So decades. But, <laughs> yeah, but we decades. haven't named them yet. Yes, we haven't named them. Okay. Any other discussion? Um. Yeah. So I I have a I I, I agree. All three candidates are very strong. I guess I I. Um, and not that I don't believe you, Greg, but I just, I, I, I take pause with the, the conflict of, potential conflict of interest piece. So I'm not sure how this works. Um, I don't know if I've done a vote like this. If I... Uh, we could separate the candidates if that would be preferred. I guess I would prefer that if, if possible. Okay, I would ask that the uh, submitter of the motion and the second if they would consider withdrawing their motion and second? No, we can vote on this. I'm not sure what you, what you. Well, uh, Nat has decided not to withdraw his motion. Okay. The second, is that being withdrawn? No. No. Carl, the motion and the second still stand. Okay, so if I if I'm in support of one but not the other, then I have to say no to both. You could uh, make a motion to amend, and then say who I the two that yep. I prefer. Yes. Okay. All right, so I make a motion to amend um, that we appoint um, that we appoint. Uh, Diana Osborne and Duncan Hastings. Do we have a second? Lacking a second, the motion dies. And the motion dies. We're back to the original motion. We have a motion to appoint Diana and Greg for the study committee. Any more discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. And now we'll do a roll call. The, uh, Nat, how do you vote? Again, this is the original. Yes. 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 Kyle, how do you vote? No. Nay. Doug, how do you vote? Aye. 
and the chair votes in favor as well. Congratulations, Greg and Diana. Yeah. Okay, uh, somebody brought up COVID-19. Yes, that was me. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna bring up the letter I received from a citizen um, who happens to be an MVU employee, but also a Johnson resident. Um, so I just wanted to report to you that there were about a dozen or more college kids, um, and they know this because they've seen, they saw these um, students on campus earlier in the day, um, at the elementary school, the Johnson Elementary School, playing basketball with no social distancing and no masks. He called the head of public safety and they have no plan in place for enforcing anything, they told the students, which I think is to social distance and wear masks. Students haven't gotten a second test yet, and we're told their second test needs to be negative before they go off campus. Um, so wondering if this could be brought up at the next select board meeting, letting people know this is a problem that is already happening. So I said we happen to be having a meeting tonight, and I would bring it up. So these are college kids on the elementary school's grounds? Yeah. Playing okay. basketball. Nothing like making it complicated. Right. Uh, probably, I mean, a college is doing the best they can to reiterate the importance of the social distancing, even off from campus. I'm not sure how much enforcement they really have. The school also is trying to do the same, but they have opened up their basketball court and they probably do not have 724 surveillance. I guess we can share that with the college. Although you said they, they have shared it. Sounds like they have, they, they kind of hit a dead end right away just because there isn't a, they, they don't have a way of enforcing that. Right, yeah. So. I mean, I mean, you, we're seeing this around the country. If you watch news, all the college campuses are are opening back up and there's a lot of partying going on and social distancing is not being uh, adhered to. Yeah. Nat, you got some? Yeah, I, I think the only teeth we have in this is um, being able to recommend to the principal, David Manning, that uh, he closes the basketball court again. Yeah, that might be the. You know. We're getting comments in the chat that a few other people have seen similar groups. Okay. Just since this weekend, when the college kids come back, I saw I saw a group playing basketball there three days ago. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Uh, reach out to Dave Manning and uh, Jonathan Davis from the NVU and see what their thoughts are. I, I don't, I really don't have the answer unless one of you guys get it. Yeah, I just wanted to pass it on to the, mostly to the emergency management team. Because yeah, you are. I'll, I'll run it through them and see what, if anybody's got any great, uh, brainstorm on how we can uh, address this. Okay, yeah. <laughs> can you send, is that an email file that you have? Yeah. Can you forward it to me? Yes. Thank you. So you're it? Yes. I think when you talk to Dave Manny and Jonathan, you should ask them or inquire uh, uh, or think about if not there, where, you know, will they go yeah. underground? What, what, what happens, you know, you right. want to improve, you want to reduce the transmissibility, not increase it. Not transfer it somewhere else. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, again, this, uh, it's too bad for the John, you know, the residents that are using it responsibly and. Right. It's, you know, it's a great, it's a great outdoor out outlet for our, for our town, so. Okay. It is a good point though, at least for the initial, you know, until they've gotten their two tests, 
to to close it down, I think doesn't it's not that big a sacri you know, if it just yeah. At least for that period of time. Okay. Uh, that's all I show except for the two executive session items. <laughs> Unless I'm missing something. Okay, I guess I would look for a motion to enter into executive session for a labor and staffing matter. Before we do, uh, how do we get back into executive session? Do we have a password or something? It looks like uh, they've actually improved the controls a little bit. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, we're going to join and you're going to let us in. Uh, you won't actually even have to rejoin. Okay. Um, we'll have to take a couple minute break while I change some settings, uh, but I'll remove everybody who's not invited to the executive session and then uh, we'll I'll close the meeting for people won't be able to rejoin until we leave and uh, then we'll be able to do our executive session. And when the motion's made, yourself should be invited as well as uh, Brian, is he still on? No, I guess he isn't. Okay. Uh, he isn't, but he should be invited. Um, okay. And is Rosemary invited for either one of these? Uh, Rosemary should be invited. Um, okay. I don't think that she has to attend either one if she doesn't want to. Um, okay. Yeah. They're... And yeah, they're, they're both a little bit relevant, but not terribly. So more than welcome to attend Rosemary, but uh, yeah, you don't have to. So the first, okay, your agenda's got uh, the labor one first and attorney second, but your report's the opposite. Yeah, they're flipped. So we're going to do labor and staffing first. Who wants to, uh, lacking a mic, take his uh, lead on making these motions? Well, I don't have the proper language. Does anybody? It's in his report. Oh, it's in the Brian's. report. Yeah, it is. Way down there. All right, move that we go into an executive session for a labor and staffing member as allowed under 1 BSA 313A1. We have a motion to enter into executive session. Do we have a second? Second. A motion is second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, and show us in executive session at whatever the time is. Aye.